Section 13 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 36. Henry IV, Catholic King, 1593 to 1610, Part 8. Mornay began by owning that, quote, out of four thousand quotations made by him, it was unlikely that some would not be found wherein he might have erred, as he was human, but he was quite sure that it was never in bad faith, end quote. He then said that being pressed for time, he had not yet been able to collate more than nineteen out of the sixty quotations specially attacked. Of these nineteen, nine only were examined at this first conference, and nearly all were found to be incorrect next day mornay was taken quote, with a violent seizure and repeated attacks of vomiting which m de la riviere the king's premier physician came and disposed to end quote. the conference was broken off and not resumed afterwards the king congratulated himself beyond measure at the result and even on the part which he had taken quote, tell the truth said he to the bishop of Vevreux. the good right had good need of aid end quote and he wrote on the sixth of may to the duke of epernon quote, the diocese of evreux has beaten that of saumur the bearer was present and will tell you that i did wonders assuredly it is one of the greatest hits for the church of god that have been made for some time End quote. he evidently had it very much at heart that the pope should be well informed of what had taken place and feel obliged to him for it quote, haven't you wits to see that the king, in order to gratify the Pope, has been pleased to sacrifice my father's honour at his feet? said the young Philip de Mornay to some courtiers who were speaking to him about this sad affair. This language was reported to the king, who showed himself much hurt by it. Quote, he is a young man beside himself with grief, they said, and it is his own father's case. End quote. Quote, young he is not replied the king he is forty years old twenty in age and twenty from his father's teaching end quote. the king's own circle and his most distinguished servants gladly joined in his self-congratulation well he said to sully what think you of your pope end quote. Quote, i think sir answered sully that he is more pope than you suppose cannot you see that he gives a red hat to m evreux really i never saw a man so dumbfounded or one who defended himself so ill if our religion had no better foundation than his crosswise legs and arms mornay habitually kept them so i would abandon it rather to-day than to-morrow economie royale page three forty six sully desired nothing better than to find mornay at fault and to see the king fully convinced of it jealousy is nowhere more wide awake and more implacable than at courts however amongst the grandees present at the conference of fontainebleau there were some who did not share the general impression quote, i saw there said the duke of mayenne as he went away from it only a very old and very faithful servant very badly paid for so many services End quote. and in spite of the king's letter the duke of epernon sent word to mornay that he still took him for a gentleman of honour and still remained his friend henry the fourth himself with his delicate and ready tact was not slow to perceive that he had gone too far and had behaved badly being informed that mornay was in deep suffering he sent to him m de lomeny his cabinet secretary to fully assure him that the king would ever be his good master and friend Quote, as for master said mornay i am only too sensible of it as for friend he belongs not to me i have known men to make attempts upon the king's life honour and state nay upon his very bed against them the whole of them he never displayed so much severity as against me alone who have done him service all my life and he set out on his way back to saumur without seeing the king again he returned thither with all he had dearest in the world his wife charlotte arbalès de la borde his worthy partner in all his trials trials of prosperity as well as adversity she has full right to a few lines in this history for it was she who preserved to us in her memoir the picture so salutary to contemplate of the life and character of mornay in the midst of his friends outbursts of passion and his adversary's brutal exhibitions of hatred as intelligent as she was devoted she gave him aid in his theological studies and labours as well as in the confronting of public events Quote, 
during this expedition to fontainebleau i had remained she says at paris in extreme apprehension recently recovered from a severe illness harassed by the deadlock in our domestic affairs and as for all that i felt it not in comparison with the inevitable mishap of this expedition i had found for m du plessis all the books of which he might possibly have need hunted up with great diligence considering the short time in the libraries of all our friends and i got them into his hands but somewhat late in the day because it was too late in the day when he gave me the commission the private correspondence of these two noble persons is a fine example of conjugal and christian union virtue and affection in sixteen o five their only son philippe de mornay a very distinguished young man then twenty-six years of age obtained henry the fourth's authority to go and serve in the army of the prince of orange maurice of nassau at deadly war with spain he was killed in it on the twenty third of october at the assault upon the town of gueldre on receiving news of his death quote, i have now no son said his father therefore i now have no wife End quote. his sorrowful prediction was no delusion six months after her son's death madame de mornay succumbed unable any longer to bear the burden she was supporting without a murmur her memoir concludes with this expression quote, it is but reasonable that this my book should end with him as it was only undertaken to describe to him our pilgrimage in this life and since it hath pleased god he hath sooner gone through and more easily ended his own wherefore indeed if i feared not to cause affliction to m du plessis who the more mine grows upon me makes me the more clearly perceive his affection it would vex me extremely to survive him on learning by letter from prince maurice that the young man was dead henry the fourth said with emotion to those present quote, i have lost the fairest hope of a gentleman in my kingdom i am grieved for the father i must send and comfort him no father but he could have such a loss end quote. Quote, he dispatched on the instant says madame de mornay herself sieur bruneau one of his secretaries with very gracious letters to comfort us with orders nevertheless not to present himself unless he were sure that we already knew of it otherwise not wishing to be the first to tell us such sad news end quote. memoir page one o seven this touching evidence of a king's sympathy for a father's grief effaced no doubt to some extent in mornay's mind his reminiscences of the conference at fontainebleau one thing is quite certain that he continued to render henry the fourth in the synods and political assemblies of the protestants his usual good offices for the maintenance or re-establishment of peace and good understanding between the catholic king and his malcontent former friends a third protestant theodore agrippa d'aubigne grandfather of madame de maintenon has been reckoned here amongst not the councillors certainly but the familiar and still celebrated servants of henry the fourth he held no great post and had no great influence with the king he was on every occasion a valiant soldier a zealous protestant an indefatigable lover and seeker of adventure sometimes an independent thinker frequently an eloquent and bold speaker always a very sprightly companion henry the fourth at one time employed him at another held aloof from him or forgot him or considered him a mischief-maker a faction-monger who must be put in the bastille and against whom if it seemed good there would be enough to put him on his trial madame de chatillon who took an interest in d'aubigne warned him of the danger and urged him to depart that very evening Quote, i will think about it madame said he i will implore god's assistance and i will see what i have to do End quote. Quote, the inspiration that came to me says he was to go next morning very early to see his majesty and after having briefly set before him my past services to ask him for a pension which up to that time i had not felt inclined to do the king surprised and at the same time well pleased to observe a something mercenary behind all my proud spirit embraced me and granted on the spot what i asked of him the next day d'aubigne went to the arsenal sully invited him to dinner and took him to see the bastille assuring him that there was no longer any danger for him but only since the last twenty-four hours la france protestante by m hag page one seventy if d'aubigne had not been a writer he would be completely forgotten by this time like so many other intriguing and turbulent adventurers who make a great deal of fuss themselves and try to bring everything about them into a fuss as long as they live and who die without leaving any trace of their career but d'aubigne wrote a great deal both in prose and in verse he wrote the histoire universelle of his times personal memoir 
tales tragedies and theological and satirical essays and he wrote with sagacious penetrating unpremeditated wit rare vigor and original and almost profound talent for discerning and depicting situations and characters it is the writer which has caused the man to live and has assigned him a place in french literature even more than in french history we purpose to quote two fragments of his which will make us properly understand and appreciate both the writer and the man during the civil war in the reign of henry the third d'aubigne had made himself master of the island of oleron had fortified it and considered himself insufficiently rewarded by the king of navarre to whom he had meant to render and had in fact rendered service after the battle of coutras in fifteen eighty seven he was sleeping with a comrade named jacques de comont la force in the wardrobe of the chamber in which the king of navarre slept Quote, la force said d'aubigne to his bedfellow our master is a regular miser and the most ungrateful mortal on the face of the earth End quote. Quote, what dost say d'aubigne asked la force half asleep Quote, he says repeated the king of navarre who had heard all that i am a regular miser and the most ungrateful mortal on the face of the earth d'aubigne somewhat disconcerted was mum quote, but he adds when daylight appeared, this prince, who liked neither rewarding nor punishing, did not for all that look any the more black at me, or give me a quarter-crown more." Thirty years later, in 1617, after the collapse of the League, and after the reign of Henry IV, d'Aubigne, wishing to describe the two leaders of the two great parties, sums them up in these terms. Quote, the duke of mayenne had such probity as is human, a good nature and a liberality which made him most pleasant to those about him his was a judicious mind which made good use of experience took the measure of everything by the card a courage rather steady than dashing take him for all in all he might be called an excellent captain king henry the fourth had all this save the liberality but to make up for that item his rank caused expectations as to the future to blossom which made the hardships of the present go down he had amongst his points of superiority to the duke of mayenne a marvellous gift of promptitude and vivacity and far beyond the average we have seen him a thousand times in his life make pat replies without hearing the purport of a request and forestall questions without committing himself the duke of mayenne was incommoded by his great bodily bulk which could not support the burden either of arms or of fatigue duty the other having worked all his men to a standstill would send for hounds and horses for to begin a hunt and when his horses could go no farther he would run down the game afoot the former communicated his heaviness and his maladies to his army undertaking no enterprise that he could not support in person the other communicated his own liveliness to those about him and his captains imitated him from complaisance and from emulation End quote these politicians these christians these warriors had in sixteen hundred a grave question to solve for henry the fourth and grave counsel to give him he was anxious to separate from his wife marguerite de valois who had in fact been separated from him for the last fifteen years was leading a rather irregular life and had not brought him any children but in order to obtain from the pope annulment of the marriage it was first necessary that marguerite should consent to it and at no price would she consent so long as the king's favourite continued to be gabriel d'estrees whom she detested and by whom henry already had several children the question arose in fifteen ninety eight in connection with a son lately born to gabriel who was constantly spreading reports that she would be the king's wife to give consistency to this report she took it into her head to have her son presented at baptism as a child of france and an order was brought to sully quote, to pay what was right to the heralds trumpeters and hautbois players who had performed at the baptism of alexander monsieur child of france end quote. after looking at the order sully detained it and had another made out which made no mention of alexander the men complained saying quote, sir the sum we ought to have for our attendance at the baptism of children of france has for a long while been fixed End quote. Quote, away away said sully in a rage i'll do nothing of the sort there are no children of france End quote. and he told the king about it who said quote, there's malice in that but i will certainly stop it tear up that order End quote and turning to some of his courtiers quote, see the tricks that people play and the traps they lay for those who serve me well and after my own heart an order hath been sent to m de rosny with the design of offending me if he honoured it or of offending the duchess of beaufort if he repudiated it 
i will see to it go to her my friend he said to rosny tell her what has taken place satisfy her in so far as you can if that is not sufficient i will speak like the master and not like the man sully went to the cloister of st germain where the duchess of beaufort was lodged and told her that he came by the king's command to inform her of what was going on quote, i am aware of all said gabriel and do not care to know any more I am not made as the king is, whom you persuade that black is white. End quote. Quote, ho, ho, madame, replied Sully, since you take it in that way, I kiss your hands, and shall not fail to do my duty for all your furies. End quote. He returned to the Louvre and told the king, quote, Here, come with me, said Henry, I will let you see that women have not possession of me, as certain malignant spirits spread about that they have. End quote he got into sully's carriage went with him to the duchess of beaufort's and taking her by the hand said quote, now madame let us go into your room and let nobody else enter except you and rosny and me i want to speak to you both and teach you to be good friends together then having shut the door quite close and holding gabriel with one hand and rosny with the other he said quote, good god madame what is the meaning of this so you would vex me for sheer wantonness of heart in order to try my patience by god i swear to you that if you continue these fashions of going on you will find yourself very much out in your expectations i see quite well that you have been put up to all this pleasantry in order to make me dismiss a servant whom i cannot do without and who has always served me loyally for five and twenty years by god i will do nothing of the kind and i declare to you that if i were reduced to such a necessity as to choose between losing one or the other i could do better without ten mistresses like you than one servant like him End quote. Gabriel stormed, was disconsolate, wept, threw herself at the king's feet, and said, quote, Seeing him more strong minded than had been supposed by those who had counselled her to this escapade, began to calm herself, says Sully, and everything was set right again on every side. End, quote. End of section thirteen. Section 14 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 36. Henry IV, Catholic King, 1593-1610. to Part 9. But Sully was not at the end of his embarrassments, or of the sometimes feeble and sometimes sturdy fancies of his king on the tenth of april fifteen ninety nine gabriel d'estrees died so suddenly that according to the bias of the times when in the highest ranks crimes were so common that they were always considered possible and almost probable she was at first supposed to have been poisoned but there seemed to be no likelihood of this the consent of marguerite de valois to the annulment of her marriage was obtained and negotiations were opened at rome by arnold de sa who was made a cardinal and by brulard de sillery ambassador ad hoc but a new difficulty supervened not for the negotiators who knew or appeared to know nothing about it but for sully in three or four weeks after the death of gabriel d'estrees henry the fourth was paying court to a new favourite one morning at fontainebleau just as he was going out hunting he took sully by the hand led him into the first gallery gave him a paper and turning the other way as if he were ashamed to see it read by sully quote, read that said he and then tell me your opinion of it End quote. Sully found that it was a promise of marriage given to Madame Henriette d'Entraigues, daughter of Francis de Balzac, lord of Entraigues, and Marie Touchet, favourite of Charles the Ninth. Sully went up to the king, holding in his hand the paper folded up. Quote, "'What do you think of it?' said the king. "'Now, now, speak freely. Your silence offends me far more than your most adverse expressions could. I misdoubt me much that you will not give me your approval, if it were only for the hundred thousand crowns that I made you hand over with so much regret. I promise you not to be vexed at anything you can possibly say to me. End quote. Quote, you mean it, sir, and you promise not to be angry with me, whatever I may say or do. End quote. Quote, yes, yes, I promise all you desire, since for anything you say it will be all the same, neither more nor less. End quote. Thereupon, taking that written promise as if he would have given it back to the king, Sully, instead of that, tore it in two, saying, quote, There, sir, as you wish to know, is what I think about such a promise. End quote. Quote, ah, morbleu, what are you at? Are you mad? End quote. Quote, 
it is true sir i am a madman and a fool and i wish i were so much thereof as to be the only one in france End quote. Quote, very well very well i understand you said the king and will say no more in order to keep my word to you but give me back that paper End quote. Quote, sir replied sully i have no doubt your majesty is aware that you are destroying all the preparatives for your dismarriage for this promise once divulged and it is demanded of you for no other purpose never will the queen your wife do the things necessary to make your dismarriage valid nor indeed will the pope bestow upon it his apostolic blessing that i know of my own knowledge the king made no answer went out of the gallery entered his closet asked for pen and ink remained there a quarter of an hour wrote out a second paper like that which had just been torn up mounted his horse without saying a word to sully whom he met went hunting and during the day deposited the new promise of marriage with henriette d'entraigues who kept it or had it kept in perfect secrecy till the second of july the time at which her father the count of entraigues gave her up to the king in consideration of twenty thousand crowns cash in the teeth of all these incidents known or voluntarily ignored the negotiations for the annulment of the marriage of henry the fourth and marguerite de valois were proceeded with at rome by the consent of the two parties clement the eighth had pronounced on the seventeenth of december fifteen ninety nine and transmitted to paris by cardinal de joyeuse the decree of annulment on the sixth of january sixteen hundred henry the fourth gave his ambassador brulard de sillery powers to conclude at florence his marriage with mary de medici daughter of francis i de medici grand duke of tuscany and joan archduchess of austria and niece of the grand duke ferdinand i de medici who had often rendered henry the fourth pecuniary services dearly paid for as early as the year fifteen ninety two there had been something said about this project of alliance it was resumed and carried out on the fifth of october sixteen hundred at florence with lavish magnificence mary embarked at leghorn on the seventeenth with a fleet of seventeen galleys that of which she was aboard the general was all covered over with jewels inside and out she arrived at marseilles on the third of november and at lyons on the second of december where she waited till the ninth for the king who was detained by the war with savoy he entered her chamber in the middle of the night booted and armed and next day in the cathedral church at st john re-celebrated his marriage more rich in wealth than it was destined to be in happiness mary de medici was beautiful in fifteen ninety two when she had first been talked about and her portrait at that time had charmed the king but in sixteen hundred she was twenty-seven tall fat with round staring eyes and a forbidding air and ill-dressed she knew hardly a word of french and henriette d'entraigues whom the king had made marquise de verneuil could not help exclaiming when she saw her quote, so that is the fat bankeress from florence end quote. henry the fourth seemed to have attained in his public and in his domestic life the pinnacle of earthly fortune and ambition he was at one and the same time catholic king and the head of the protestant polity in europe accepted by the catholics as the best the only possible king for them in france he was at peace with all europe except one petty prince the duke of savoy charles emmanuel i from whom he demanded back the marquisette of saluzzo or a territorial compensation in france itself on the french side of the alps after a short campaign and thanks to rosny's ordinance he obtained what he desired and by a treaty of january the seventeenth sixteen o one he added to french territory la bresse le bugy the district of guesch and the citadel of bourg which still held out after the capture of the town he was more and more dear to france to which he had restored peace at home as well as abroad and industrial commercial financial monumental and scientific prosperity until lately unknown sully covered the country with roads bridges canals buildings and works of public utility the moment the king after the annulment of his marriage with marguerite de valois saw his new wife mary de medici at lyons she had disgusted him and she disgusted him more every day by her cantankerous and headstrong temper but on the twenty seventh of september sixteen o one she brought him a son who was to be louis the thirteenth henry used to go for distraction from his wife's temper to his favourite henriette d'entraigues who knew how to please him at the same time that she was haughty and exacting towards him he set less store upon the peace of his household than upon that of his kingdom he had established his favourite at the louvre itself close beside his wife and his new marriage once contracted he considered his domestic life settled as well as his political position 
he was mistaken on both points he was not at the end of either his political dangers or his amorous fancies since fifteen ninety five his principal companion in arms or rather his camp favourite charles de gontaut baron de biron whom he had made admiral duke and marshal of france was all the while continuing to serve him in the field becoming day by day a determined conspirator against him he had begun by being a reckless gamester and in that way he lost fifteen hundred thousand crowns about six millions of francs of our day Quote, i don't know said he whether i shall die on the scaffold or not but i will never come to the poorhouse he added quote, when peace is concluded the king's love affairs the scarcity of his largesses and the discontent of many will lead to plenty of splits more than are necessary to embroil the most peaceful kingdoms in the world and should that fail we shall find in religion more than we want to put the most lukewarm huguenot in a passion and the most penitent leaguers in a fury End quote. henry the fourth regarded biron with tender affection quote, i never loved anybody as i loved him he used to say i would have trusted my son and my kingdom to him he has done me good service but he cannot say that i did not save his life three times i pulled him out of the enemy's hands at fontaine francaise so wounded and so dazed with blows that as i had acted soldier in saving him i also acted marshal as regarded the retreat biron nevertheless prosecuted his ambitious designs the independent sovereignty of burgundy was what he aspired to and any alliance any plot was welcome as a stepping-stone caesar or nothing he would say i will not die without seeing my head on a quarter-crown piece he entered into flagrant conspiracy with the king of spain with the duke of savoy with the french malcontents the duke of bouillon and the count of auvergne henry the fourth knew it and made every effort to appear ignorant of it to win biron back to him he paid his debts he sent him on an embassy he tempted him to confessions which should entitle him to a full pardon Quote, let him weep he would say and i will weep with him let him remember what he owes me and i will not forget what i owe him i were loath that marshal de biron should be the first example of my just severity and that my reign which has hitherto been calm and serene should be charged all at once with thunder and lightning he employed rosny to bring biron to confess quote, my friend said he here is an unhappy man the marshal it is a serious case i am anxious to spare him i cannot bring myself to harm a man who has courage who has served me so long and been so familiar to me my fear is that though i spare him he will not spare me or my children or my kingdom he would never confess anything to me he behaves to me like a man who has some mischief in his heart i beg you to see him if he is open with you assure him that he may come to me and i will forgive him with all my heart rosny tried and failed quote, it is not i who want to destroy this man said the king it is he who wants to destroy himself i will myself tell him that if he lets himself be brought to justice he has no mercy whatever to expect from me End quote. he saw biron at fontainebleau received him after dinner spoke to him with his usual familiarity and pointing to his own equestrian statue in marble which was on the mantelpiece said quote, what would the king of spain say if he saw me like that eh End quote. Quote, he would not be much afraid of you answered biron henry gave him a stern look the marshal tried to take back his words quote, i mean sir if he were to see you in that statue yonder and not in your own person End quote. the retreat was not successful the shot had taken effect henry left the room went back into his closet and gave orders to his captain of the guard to arrest him then he returned to the room and said quote, marshal reflect upon what i have said to you End quote biron preserved a frigid silence quote, adieu baron de biron said the king thus by a single word annulling all his dignities and sending him before his proper judges to answer for his treasons on the eighteenth of june sixteen o two he brought the marshal before the court of parliament the inquiry lasted three weeks biron was unanimously condemned to death by a hundred and twenty-seven judges quote, for conspiracies against the king's person attempts upon his kingdom and treasons and treaties with the enemies of the kingdom End quote. the king gave to this sentence all the alleviations compatible with public interests he allowed biron to make his will remitted the confiscation of his property and ordered that the execution should take place at the bastille in the presence of certain functionaries and not on the place de greve and before the mob when biron found himself convicted and sentenced he burst into a fury 
loaded his judges with insults, and roared out that, quote, if he were driven to despair and frenzy, he would strangle half of those present, and force the other half to kill him, end quote. The executioner was obliged to strike him unawares. Those present withdrew, dumbfounded at the crime, the prisoner's rage, the execution, and the scene. When the question of conspiracies and conspirators, with Spain against France and her king, had thus been publicly raised and decided, it entailed another. Had the Spanish monks, the Jesuits to call them by their own name, taken part therein? Should proceedings accordingly be taken against them? They were no longer in France. They had been banished on the twenty ninth of December, 1594, by a solemn decree of Parliament after John Chatel's attempt. They were demanding their return. The Pope was demanding it for them. Quote, if at other times, they said, the society had shown hostility to France and her king, it was because, though well received everywhere else, especially in the dominions of the king of Spain, they had met in France with nothing but persecutions and insults. If Henry would be pleased to testify good will towards them, he would soon find them devoted to his person and his throne. End quote. The question was debated at the king's council, and especially between Henry the Fourth and Sully when they were together. Sully did not like the return of the Jesuits. Quote, they are away, said he, let them remain so. If they return, it will be all very fine for them to wish, and all very fine for them to act. Their presence, their discourse, their influence, involuntary though it be, will be opposed to you, will heat your enemies, will irritate your friends. Hatred and mistrust will go on increasing. End quote. The king was of a different opinion. Quote, of necessity, he said to Sully, I must now do one of two things, admit the Jesuits purely and simply, relieve them from the defamation and insults with which they have been blasted, and put to the proof all their fine sentiments and excellent promises, or use against them all severities that can be imagined to keep them from ever coming near me and my dominions, in which latter case there is no doubt it would be enough to reduce them to utter despair and to thoughts of attempting my life which would render me miserable or listless living constantly in suspicion of being poisoned or assassinated for these gentry have communications and correspondence everywhere and great dexterity in disposing men's minds as it seems good to them it were better for me to be dead being therein of caesar's opinion that the pleasantest death is that which is least foreseen and apprehended End quote. The king then called to remembrance the eight projected or attempted assassinations which, since the failure of John Chatel from 1596 to 1603, had been, and clearly established to have been, directed against him. Upon this, Sully at once went over to the king's opinion. In September 1603, letters for the restoration of the Jesuits were issued and referred to the Parliament of Paris they there met on the twenty fourth of december with strong opposition and remonstrances that have remained celebrated the mouthpiece being the premier president achille de harlay the same who had courageously withstood the duke of guise he conjured the king to withdraw his letters patent and to leave intact the decree which had banished the jesuits this was not he said the feeling of the parliament of paris only but also of the parliaments of normandy and burgundy that is of two-thirds of the magistrates throughout the kingdom henry was touched and staggered he thanked the parliament most affectionately but quote, we must not reproach the jesuits for the league said he it was the fault of the times leave me to deal with this business i have managed others far more difficult End quote. the parliament obeyed though with regret and on the second of january sixteen o four the king's letters patent were enregistered this was not the only business that henry had at heart he had another of another sort, and for him more difficult to manage. In February 1609 he saw for the first time at the court of France Charlotte Marguerite, third daughter of the constable de Montmorency, only sixteen years old. Quote, there was at that time, say all contemporaries, nothing so beautiful under heaven, or more graceful, or more perfect. End quote. Before presenting her at court, her father had promised her to Francis de Bassompierre, descended from a branch of the House of Cloves, thirty years old and already famous for his wit, his magnificence, and his gallantry. He was one of the principal gentlemen of the chamber to the king. Henry the Fourth sent for him one morning, made him kneel on a hassock in front of his bed, and said that, obtaining no sleep, he had been thinking of him the night before, and of getting him married. Quote, As for me, says Bassompierre, who was thinking of nothing so little as of what he wanted to say to me, I answered that if it were not for the constable's gout, it would have already been done. 
no said he to me i thought of getting you married to mademoiselle d'aumale and in consequence of that marriage of renewing the duchy of aumale in your person i asked him if he wanted me to have two wives then he said to me with a deep sigh passons pierre i will speak to thee as a friend i have become not only enamoured but mad beside myself about mademoiselle de montmorency if thou wed her and she love thee i shall hate thee if she loved me thou wouldst hate me it is better that this should not be the cause of destroying our good understanding for i love thee affectionately and sincerely i am resolved to marry her to my nephew the prince of conde and keep her near my family that shall be the consolation and the support of the old age which is coming upon me i shall give my nephew who is young and loves hunting ten thousand times better than women a hundred thousand francs a year to pass his time and i want no other favour from her but her affection without looking for anything more thoroughly astounded and put out as he was bassompierre reflected that it was so far as he was concerned quote, an amour modified by marriage end quote, and that it would be better to give way to the king with a good grace end quote. i withdraw sir he said on very good terms as regarded mademoiselle de montmorency as well as himself the king embraced him wept promised to love him dearly saw him again in the evening in company with mademoiselle de montmorency who knew nothing and conversed a long while with the young princess when she retired perceiving that bassompierre was watching her she shrugged her shoulders as if to hint to him what the king had said to her Quote, i lie not says bassompierre that single action pierced me to the heart i spent two days in tormenting myself like one possessed without sleeping drinking or eating End quote. Two or three days afterwards, the Prince of Condé announced that he intended to marry Mademoiselle de Montmorency. The court and the city talked of nothing but this romance and the betrothal which immediately followed. End of section 14. Section 15 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 36, Henry IV, Catholic King, 1593-1610, to Part 10. Henry IV was fifty-six. He had been given to gallantry all his life, and he had never been faithful or exacting in his attachments he was not one of those on whom ridicule fastens as fair prey but he was so under the dominion of his new passion that the young princess of conde who had at first exclaimed quote, jesus my god he is mad end quote, began to fancy to herself that she would be queen before long mary de medici became jealous and uneasy she determined to take her precautions and demanded to be crowned before the king set out on the campaign which it was said he was about to commence against austria in accordance with his grand design and in concert with the protestant princes of germany his allies the prince of conde had a fit of jealousy he carried off his wife first into picardy and then to brussels where he left her henry the fourth in respect first of going to see her then of getting her to come back then of threatening to go after her out of france took some wild and puerile steps which being coincident with his warlike announcements and preparations caused some strange language to be used and were injurious to his personal weight as well as to his government's character for steadiness sully grew impatient and uneasy mary de medici was insisting strongly upon being crowned the prospect of this coronation was displeasing to henry the fourth and he did not conceal it quote, hey my friend he said to sully i know not what is the meaning of it but my heart tells me that some misfortune will happen to me End quote. he was sitting on a low chair which had been made for him by sully's orders at the arsenal thinking and beating his fingers on his spectacle case then all of a sudden he jumped up and slapping his hands upon his thighs quote, by god he said i shall die in this city and shall never go out of it they will kill me i see quite well that they have no other remedy in their dangers but my death ah a cursed coronation thou wilt be the cause of my death End quote. Quote, jesus sir cried sully what fancy of yours is this if it continue i am of opinion that you should break off this anointment and coronation and expedition and war if you please to give me orders it shall soon be done End quote. Quote, yes break off the coronation said the king let me hear no more about it i shall have my mind at rest from diverse fancies which certain warnings have put into it 
to bide nothing from you i have been told that i was to be killed at the first grand ceremony i should undertake and that i should die in a carriage end quote. Quote, you never told me that sir and so have i often been astounded to see you cry out when in a carriage as if you had dreaded this petty peril after having so many times seen you amidst cannon-balls musketry lance-thrusts pike-thrusts and sword-thrusts without being a bit afraid since your mind is so exercised thereby if i were you i would go away to-morrow let the coronation take place without you or put it off to another time and not enter paris for a long while or in a carriage if you please i will send word to notre dame and st denis to stop everything and to withdraw the workmen quote. Quote, i am very much inclined said the king but what will my wife say for she hath gotten this coronation marvellously into her head quote. Quote, she may say what she likes but i cannot think that when she knows your opinion about it she will persist any longer whatever sully might say mary de medici quote, took infinite offence at the king for his alarms the matter was disputed for three days with high words on all sides and at last the labourers were sent back to work again End quote. henry in spite of his presentiments made no change in his plans he did not go away he did not defer the queen's coronation on the contrary he had it proclaimed on the twelfth of may sixteen ten that she would be crowned next day the thirteenth at st denis and that on sunday the sixteenth she would make her entry into paris on friday the fourteenth he had an idea of going to the arsenal to see sully who was ill we have the account of this visit and of the king's assassination given by malherbe at that time attached to the service of henry the fourth in a letter written on the nineteenth of may from the reports of eye-witnesses and it is here reproduced word for word quote, the king set out soon after dinner to go to the arsenal he deliberated a long while whether he should go out and several times said to the queen my dear shall i go or not he even went out two or three times and then all on a sudden returned and said to the queen my dear shall i really go and again he had doubts about going or remaining at last he made up his mind to go and having kissed the queen several times bade her adieu amongst other things that were remarked he said to her i shall only go there and back i shall be here again almost directly when he got to the bottom of the steps where his carriage was waiting for him m de praslin his captain of the guard would have attended him but said to him get you gone i want nobody go about your business thus having about him only a few gentlemen and some footmen he got into his carriage took his place on the back seat at the left-hand side and made m d'epernon sit at the right next to him by the door were m de montbazon and m de la force and by the door on m d'epernon's side were marshal de lavardin and m de cresqui on the front seat the marquis of mirabeau and his first equerry when he came to the croix du tiroir he was asked whether it was his pleasure to go he gave orders to go towards saint innocent on arriving at rue de la ferronnerie which is at the end of that of saint honore on the way to that of saint denis opposite the salamandre he met a cart which obliged the king's carriage to go nearer to the ironmonger's shops which are on the saint innocent side and even to proceed somewhat more slowly without stopping however though somebody who was in a hurry to get the gossip printed has written to that effect here it was that an abominable assassin who had posted himself against the nearest chop which is that with the coeur couronné percé d'une flèche darted upon the king and dealt him one after the other two blows with a knife in the left side one catching him between the armpit and the nipple went upwards without doing more than graze the other catches him between the fifth and sixth ribs and taking a downward direction cuts a large artery of those called venous the king by mishap and as if to further tempt this monster had his left hand on the shoulder of m de montbazon and with the other was leaning on m d'epernon to whom he was speaking he uttered a low cry and made a few movements m de montbazon having asked what is the matter sir he answered it is nothing twice but the second time so low that there was no making sure these are the only words he spoke after he was wounded in a moment the carriage turned towards the louvre when he was at the steps where he had got into the carriage which are those of the queen's room some wine was given him of course some one had already run forward to bear the news sieur de serizy lieutenant of m de praslin's company having raised his head he made a few movements with his eyes then closed them immediately without opening them again any more he was carried upstairs by m de montbazon and count de curzon en quercy and laid on the bed in his closet and at two o'clock carried to the bed in his chamber where he was all the next day and sunday 
somebody went and gave him holy water i tell you nothing about the queen's tears all that must be imagined as for the people of paris i think they never wept so much as on this occasion End quote. the grief was deep and general at the court as well as amongst the people in the provinces as well as at paris and with the grief were mingled surprise and alarm and an idea also that the king had died unhappy and uneasy on the fourteenth of may in the morning before starting upon his visit to the arsenal he had gone to hear mass at the feuillants or order of st bernard and on his return he said to the duke of guise and to bassompierre who were in attendance quote, you do not understand me now you and the rest but i shall die one of these days and when you have lost me you will know my worth and the difference there is between me and other kings quote, my god sir said bassompierre will you never cease vexing us by telling us that you will soon die you will live please god some good long years you are only in the flower of your age in perfect bodily health and strength full of honour more than any mortal man in the most flourishing kingdom in the world loved and adored by your subjects with fine houses fine women fine children who are growing up henry sighed as he said quote, my friend all that must be left these are the last words that are to be found of his in contemporary accounts a few hours afterwards he was smitten to death in his carriage brought back to the louvre laid out on his bed one of his councillors of state m de Vie, seated on the same bed had put to his mouth his cross of the order and directed his thoughts to god milan his chief physician was at the bedside weeping his surgeons wanted to dress his wounds a sigh died away on his lips and quote, it is all over said the physician he is gone End quote. Guise and Bassompierre went out to look after what was passing out of doors. They met quote, Monsieur de Sully with some forty horse, who, when he came up to us, said to us in tearful wise, Gentlemen, if the service ye vowed to the king is impressed upon your souls as deeply as it ought to be with all good Frenchmen, swear all of ye this moment to keep towards the king his son and successor the same allegiance that ye showed him, and to spend your lives and your blood in avenging his death. Sir? said bassompierre it is for us to cause this oath to be taken by others we have no need to be exhorted thereto sully turned his eyes upon him he adds and then went and shut himself up in the bastille sending out to seize and carry off all the bread that could be found in the market and at the baker's he also dispatched a message in haste to m de rouen his son-in-law bidding him face about with six thousand swiss whose colonel-general he was and march on paris end quote henry the fourth being dead it was for france and for the kingship that sully felt alarm and was taking his precautions end of section fifteen end of chapter thirty six section sixteen of a popular history of france volume five this librivox recording is in the public domain a popular history of france from the earliest times volume five by francois guizot translated by robert black chapter thirty seven regency of mary de medici sixteen ten to sixteen seventeen part one on the death of henry the fourth there was extreme disquietude as well as grief in france to judge by appearances however there was nothing to justify excessive alarm the edict of nantes april thirteenth fifteen ninety eight had put an end so far as the french were concerned to religious wars the treaty of vervins may the second fifteen ninety eight between france and spain the twelve years truce between spain and the united provinces april ninth sixteen o nine the death of philip the second september thirteenth fifteen ninety eight and the alliance between france and england seemed to have brought peace to europe it might have been thought that there remained no more than secondary questions such as the possession of the marquisate of saluzzo and the succession to the duchies of cleves and Juliet but the instinct of peoples sees further than the negotiations of diplomats in the public estimation of europe henry the fourth was a representative of and the security for order peace national and equitable policy intelligent and practical ideas so thought sully when at the king's death he went equally alarmed and disconsolate and shut himself up in the arsenal and the people had grounds for being of sully's opinion public confidence was concentrated upon the king's personality spectators pardoned almost with a smile those tender foibles of his which nevertheless his proximity to old age rendered still more shocking 
they were pleased at the clear-sighted and strict attention he paid to the education of his son louis the dauphin to whose governess madame de monglas he wrote quote, i am vexed with you for not having sent me word that you have whipped my son for i do wish and command you to whip him every time he shows obstinacy in anything wrong knowing well by my own case that there is nothing in the world that does more good than that End quote and to mary medici herself he added quote, of one thing i do assure you and that is that being of the temper i know you to be of and foreseeing that of your son you stubborn not to say headstrong madame and he obstinate you will verily have many a tussle together End quote. henry the fourth saw as clearly into his wife's as into his son's character persons who were best acquainted with the disposition of mary de medici and were her most indulgent critics said of her in sixteen ten when she was now thirty-seven years of age quote, that she was courageous haughty firm discreet vain obstinate vindictive and mistrustful inclined to idleness caring but little about affairs and fond of royalty for nothing beyond its pomp and its honours henry had no liking for her or confidence in her and in private had frequent quarrels with her yet nevertheless had her coronation solemnized and had provided by anticipation for the necessities of government on the king's death and at the imperious instance of the duke of epernon who at once introduced the queen and said in open session as he exhibited his sword quote, it is as yet in the scabbard but it will have to leap therefrom unless this moment there be granted to the queen a title which is her due according to the order of nature and of justice End quote. the parliament forthwith declared mary regent of the kingdom thanks to sully's firm administration there were after the ordinary annual expenses were paid at that time in the vaults of the bastille or in securities easily realizable forty one million three hundred and forty five thousand livres and there was nothing to suggest that extraordinary and urgent expenses would come to curtail this substantial reserve the army was disbanded and reduced to from twelve to fifteen thousand men french or swiss for a long time past no power in france had at its accession possessed so much material strength and so much moral authority but mary de medici had in her household and in her court the wherewithal to rapidly dissipate this double treasure in sixteen hundred at the time of her marriage she had brought from florence to paris her nurse's daughter leonora galliguet and leonora's husband concino concini son of a florentine notary both of them full of coarse ambition covetous vain and determined to make the best of their new position so as to enrich themselves and exalt themselves beyond measure and at any price mary gave them in that respect all the facilities they could possibly desire they were her confidants her favourites and her instruments as regarded both her own affairs and theirs these private and subordinate servants were before long joined by great lords court folks ambitious and vain likewise egotists mischief-makers whom the strong and able hand of henry the fourth had kept aloof but who at his death returned upon the scene thinking of nothing whatever but their own fortunes and their rivalries they shall just be named here pell-mell whether members or relatives of the royal family or merely great lords the conde the conti the enghien the dukes of epernon guise elbeuf mayenne bouillon and nevers great names and petty characters encountered at every step under the regency of mary de medici and with their following forming about her a court hive equally restless and useless time does justice to some few men and executes justice on the ruck one must have been of great worth indeed to deserve not to be forgotten sully appeared once more at court after his momentary retreat to the arsenal but in spite of the show of favour which mary de medici thought it prudent and decent to preserve towards him for some little time he soon saw that it was no longer the place for him and that he was of as little use there to the state as to himself he sent in one after the other his resignation of all his important offices and terminated his life in regular retirement at rosny and sully sur loire du plessis mornay attempted to still exercise a salutary influence over his party Quote, let there be no more talk amongst us said he of huguenot or papists those words are prohibited by our edicts and though there were no edict at all still if we are french if we love our country our families and even ourselves they ought henceforth to be wiped out of our remembrance whoso is a good frenchman shall to me be a citizen shall to me be a brother 
this meritorious and patriotic language was not entirely without moral effect but it no longer guided no longer inspired the government egotism intrigue and mediocrity in ideas as well as in feelings had taken the place of henry the fourth facts before long made evident the sad result of this all the parties all the personages who walked the stage and considered themselves of some account believed that the moment had arrived for pushing their pretensions and lost no time about putting them forward those persons we will just pass in review without stopping at any one of them history has no room for all those who throng about her gates without succeeding in getting in and leaving traces of their stay the reformers were the party to which the reign of henry the fourth had brought most conquests and which was bound to strive above everything to secure the possession of them by extracting from them every legitimate and practicable consequence mary de medici having been declared regent lost no time about confirming on the twenty second of may sixteen ten the edict of nantes and proclaiming religious peace as the due of france Quote, we have nothing to do with the quarrels of the grandees said the people of paris we have no mind to be mixed up with them some of the preachers of repute and of the party's old leaders used the same language quote, there must be naught but a scarf any longer between us duplessis mornay would say two great protestant names were still intact at this epoch one the duke of sully without engaging in religious polemics had persisted in abiding by the faith of his fathers in spite of his king's example and attempts to bring him over to the catholic faith the other duplessis mornay had always striven and was continuing to strive actively for the protestant cause these two illustrious champions of the reformed party were in agreement with the new principles of national right and with the intelligent instincts of their people whose confidence they deserved and seemed to possess but the passions the usages and the suspicions of the party were not slow in reappearing the protestants were highly displeased to see the catholic worship and practices re-established in berne whence queen jeanne of navarre had banished them the rights of religious liberty were not yet powerful enough with them to surmount their taste for exclusive domination as a guarantee for their safety they had been put in possession of several strong places in france neither the edict of nantes nor its confirmation by mary de medici appeared to them a sufficient substitute for this guarantee and they claimed its continuance which was granted them for five years after henry the fourth's conversion to catholicism his european policy had no longer been essentially protestant he had thrown out feelers and entered into negotiations for catholic alliances and these when the king's own liberal and patriotic spirit was no longer there to see that they did not sway his government became objects of great suspicion and antipathy to the protestants henry had constantly and to good purpose striven against the spirit of religious faction and civil war anxious after his death about their liberty and their political importance the reformers reassumed a blind confidence in their own strength and a hope of forming a small special state in the midst of the great national state their provincial assemblies and their national synods were from sixteen eleven to sixteen twenty one effective promoters of this tendency which before long became a formal and organized design at saumur at tonnein at privas at grenoble at loudun at la rochelle the language the movements and the acts of the party took more and more the character of armed resistance and ere long of civil war the leaders old and new duke henry of rohan as well as the duke of bouillon the marquis of la force as well as the duke of lesdiguieres more or less timidly urged on the zealous protestants in that path from which the ancient councils of sully and mornay were not successful in deterring them on the tenth of may sixteen twenty one in the assembly of la rochelle a commission of nine members was charged to present and get adopted a plan of military organization whereby protestant france warren included was divided into eight circles having each a special council composed of three deputies at the general assembly under a chief who had the disposal of all the military forces with each army corps there was a minister to preach the royal monies talliages aid and gable were to be seized for the wants of the army the property of the catholic church was confiscated and the revenues therefrom appropriated to the expenses of war and the pay of the ministers of the religion it was a protestant republic organized on the model of the united provinces and disposed to act as regarded the french kingship with a large measure of independence 
when, after thus preparing for war, they came to actually make it, the Protestants soon discovered their impotence. The Duke of Bouillon, sixty-five years of age and crippled with gout, interceded for them in his letters to Louis Thirteenth, but did not go out of Sedan. The Duke of Lesdiguières, to whom the Assembly had given the command of the Protestants of Burgundy, Provence, and Dauphiny, was at that very moment on the point of abjuring their faith and marching with their enemies. Duke Henry of Rouen himself, who was the youngest and seemed to be the most ardent of their new chiefs, was for doing nothing and breaking up. Quote, if you are not disposed to support the assembly, said the Marquis of Chateauneuf, who had been sent to him to bring him to a decision, it will be quite able to defend itself without you. End quote. Quote, if the assembly, said Rouen, feeling his honour touched, does take resolutions contrary to my advice, I shall not sever myself from the interest of our churches. End quote. And he sacrificed his better judgment to the popular blindness. The dukes of La Tremoille and of Soubise, and the marquises of La Force and of Chatillon followed suit. As M. de Sismondi says, to these five lords and to a small number of towns was the strength reduced of the party which was defying the King of France. Thus, since the death of Henry the Fourth, the King and Court of France were much changed. The great questions and the great personages had disappeared. The last of the real chiefs of the League, the brother of Duke Henry of Guise, the old Duke of Mayenne, he on whom Henry, in the hour of victory, would wreck no heavier vengeance than to walk him to a standstill, was dead. Henry the Fourth's first wife, the sprightly and too facile Marguerite de Valois, was dead also, after consenting to descend from the throne in order to make way for the mediocre Mary de Medici. The Catholic champion, whom Henry the Fourth felicitated himself upon being able to oppose to Duplessis Mornay in the polemical conferences between the two communions, Cardinal de Perron, was at the point of death. The decay was general, and the same amongst the Protestants as amongst the Catholics. Sully and Mornay held themselves aloof, or were barely listened to. In place of these eminent personages had come intriguing or ambitious subordinates, who were either innocent of or indifferent to anything like a great policy, and who had no idea beyond themselves and their fortunes. The husband of Leonora Galliguet, Concini, had amassed a great deal of money, and purchased the Marquisate of Ancre, nay, more. He had been created Marshal of France, and he said to the Count of Bassompierre, quote, I have learned to know the world, and I am aware that a man, when he has arrived at a certain pitch of prosperity, comes down with a greater run the higher he has mounted. When I came to France I was not worth a cent, and I owed more than eight thousand crowns. My marriage in the Queen's kind favour has given me much advancement, office and honour. I have worked at making my fortune, and I pushed it forward as long as I saw the wind favourable. So soon as I felt it turning, I thought about beating a retreat, and enjoying in peace the large property we have acquired. It is my wife who is opposed to this desire. At every crack of the whip we receive from fortune, I continue to urge her. God knows whether warnings have been wanting. My daughter's death is the last, and if we do not heed it, our downfall is at hand." Then he quietly made out an abstract of all his property, amounting to eight millions, with which he purposed to buy from the Pope the usufruct of the Duchy of Ferrara, and leave his son, besides, a fine inheritance. But his wife continued her opposition. It would be cowardly and ungrateful, she said, to abandon the Queen. Quote, so that, cried he, I see myself ruined without any help for it, and if it were not that I am under so much obligation to my wife, I would leave her and go some whither where neither grandees nor common folk would come to look after me. End, quote. End of section 16《ポピュラー・ヒストリー・オブ・フランス》5。「ポピュラー・ヒストリー・オブ・フランス」5。「A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times」Volume 5 by François Guizot。Translated by Robert Black。Chapter 37 Regency of Mary de Medici 1610-1617 Part 2 This modest style of language did not prevent Marshal Dancre from occasionally having strange fits of domineering arrogance. Quote, by God, sir, he wrote to one of his friends, I have to complain of you. You treat for peace without me. You have caused the Queen to write to me that, for her sake, I must give up the suit I had commenced against M. de Montbazon to get paid what he owes me. In all the devil's names, what do the Queen you take me for? I am devoured to my very bones with rage. End quote. 
in his dread lest influence opposed to his own should be exercised over the young king he took upon himself to regulate his amusements and his walks and prohibited him from leaving paris louis the thirteenth had amongst his personal attendants a young nobleman albert de luynes clever in training little sporting birds called butcher birds or pi griche or shriek then all the rage and the king made him his falconer and lived on familiar terms with him playing at billiards one day marshal d'ancre putting on his hat said to the king quote, i hope your majesty will allow me to be covered End quote. the king allowed it but remained surprised and shocked his young page albert de luynes observed his displeasure and being anxious himself also to become a favourite he took pains to fan it a domestic plot was set hatching against marshal d'ancre what was its extent and who were the accomplices in it this is not clear however it may have been on the twenty fourth of april sixteen seventeen m de vitry captain of the guard or capitaine de quartier that day in the royal army which was besieging soissons ordered some of his officers to provide themselves with a pistol each in their pockets and he himself went to that door of the louvre by which the king would have to go to the queen mother's when marshal d'ancre arrived at this door quote, there is the marshal said one of the officers and vitry laid hands upon him saying quote, marshal i have the king's orders to arrest you quote, me said the marshal in surprise and attempting to resist the officer fired upon him and so did several others it was never known or at any rate never told whose shot it was that hit him but quote, sir said colonel d'ornano going up to the young king you are this minute king of france marshal d'ancre is dead End quote. and the young king before the assembled court repeated with the same tone of satisfaction quote, marshal d'ancre is dead End quote. baron de vitry was appointed marshal of france in the room of the favourite whom he had just murdered the day after the murder the mob rushed into the church of saint germain lacherois where the body of marshal d'ancre had been interred they heaved up the slabs hauled the body from the ground dragged it over the pavement as far as the pont neuf where they hanged it by the feet to a gallows and they afterwards tore it in pieces which were sold burned and thrown into the seine the ferocious passions of the populace were satisfied but court hatred and court envy were not they attacked the marshal's widow leonora galigai she resided at the louvre and at the first rumour of what had happened she had sent to demand asylum with the queen mother meeting with a harsh refusal she had undressed herself in order to protect with her body her jewels which she had concealed in her mattresses the moment she was discovered she was taken to the bastille and brought before the parliament she began by throwing all the blame upon her husband it was he she said who had prevented her from retiring into italy and who had made every attempt to push his fortunes farther when she was sentenced to death leonora recovered her courage and pride Quote, never said a contemporary was anybody seen of more constant and resolute visage Quote, what a lot of people to look at one poor creature said she at sight of the crowd that thronged upon her passage there is nothing to show that her firmness at the last earned her more of sympathy than her weaknesses had brought her of compassion the mob has its seasons of pitilessness leonora galigai died leaving one child a son who was so maltreated that he persisted in refusing all food and at last would take nothing but the sweetmeats that the young queen anne of austria married two years before to louis the thirteenth had the kindness to send him we encounter in this very insignificant circumstance a trace of one of those important events which marked the earliest years of mary de medici's regency and the influence of her earliest favourites concini and his wife both of them probably in the secret service of the court of madrid had promoted the marriage of louis the thirteenth with the infanta anne of austria eldest daughter of philip the third king of spain and that of philip infante of spain who was afterwards philip the fourth with princess elizabeth of france sister of louis the thirteenth henry the fourth in his plan for the pacification of europe had himself conceived this idea and testified a desire for this double marriage but without taking any trouble to bring it about it was after his death that on the thirtieth of april sixteen twelve villeroy minister of foreign affairs in france and don inigo de caderias ambassador of the king of spain concluded this double union by a formal deed they signed on the same day at fontainebleau between the king and queen regent of france on one side and the king of spain on the other a treaty of defence of alliance to the effect quote, that those sovereigns should give one another mutual succour against such as should attempt anything against their kingdoms or revolt against their authority 
that they should in such case send one to the other at their own expense for six months a body of six thousand foot and twelve hundred horse that they should not assist any criminal charged with high treason and should even give them over into the hands of the ambassadors of the king who claimed them it is quite certain that henry the fourth would never have let his hands be thus tied by a treaty so contrary to his general policy of alliance with protestant powers such as england and the united provinces he had no notion of servile subjection to his own policy but he would have given good care not to abandon it he was of those who under delicate circumstances remain faithful to their ideas and promises without systematic obstinacy and with a due regard for the varying interests and requirements of their country and their age the two spanish marriages were regarded in france as an abandonment of the national policy france was in a great majority catholic but its catholicism differed essentially from the spanish catholicism it affirmed the entire separation of the temporal power and the spiritual power and the inviolability of the former by the latter it refused assent moreover to certain articles of the council of trent it was gallican catholicism determined to keep a pretty large measure of national independence political and moral as opposed to spanish catholicism essentially devoted to the cause of the papacy and of absolutist austria under the influence of this public feeling the two spanish marriages and the treaty which accompanied them were unfavorably regarded by a great part of france a remedy was desired it was hoped that one would be found in the convocation of the states-general of the kingdom to which the populace always looked expectantly they were convoked first for the sixteenth of september sixteen fourteen at, at sens and afterwards for the twentieth of october following when the young king louis the thirteenth after the announcement of his majority himself opened them in state amongst the members there were one hundred and forty of the clergy one hundred and thirty-two of the noblesse and one hundred and ninety-two of the third estate the clergy elected for their president cardinal de joyeuse who had crowned mary de medici the noblesse henry de beauframont baron of senecy and the third estate robert miron provo of the tradesmen of paris these elections were not worth much and have left no trace on history the chief political fact connected with the convocation of the states general of sixteen fourteen was the entry into their ranks of the youthful bishop of luçon armand jean du plessis de richelieu marked out by the finger of god to sustain after the powerful reign of henry the fourth and the incapable regency of mary de medici the weight of the government of france he was in two cases elected to the states-general by the clergy of loudun and by that of poitou as he was born on the fifth of september fifteen eighty five he was but twenty-eight years old in sixteen fourteen he had not been destined for the church and he was pursuing a layman's course of study at the college of navarre under the name of the marquis de chillon when his elder brother alphonse louis du plessis de richelieu became disgusted with ecclesiastical life turned carthusian and resigned the unpretending bishopric of luçon in favour of his brother armand whom henry the fourth nominated to it in sixteen o five instructing cardinal du perron at that time his charge d'affaires at rome to recommend to pope paul v that election which he had very much at heart the young prelate betook himself with so much ardour to his theological studies that at twenty years of age he was a doctor and maintained his theses in rochet and camaille as bishop nominate at rome some objection was still made to his extreme youth but he hastened thither and delivered before the pope a latin harangue which scattered all objections to the wind after consecration at rome in sixteen o seven he returned to paris and hastened to take possession of his see at luçon quote, the poorest and the nastiest in france as he himself said he could support poverty but he also set great store by riches and he was seriously anxious for the expenses of his installation quote, taking after you that is being a little vain he wrote to one of his fair friends madame de bourges with whom he was on terms of familiar correspondence about his affairs i should very much like being more easy in my circumstances to make more show but what can i do no house no carriage furnished apartments are inconvenient i must borrow a coach horses and a coachman in order to at least arrive at luçon with a decent turnout he purchased second-hand the velvet bed of one madame de marsonnet his aunt he made for himself a muff out of a portion of his uncle the commander's martin skins silver plate he was very much concerned about Quote, i beg you he wrote to madame de bourges to send me word what will be the cost of two dozen silver dishes of fair size as they are made now 
I should very much like to get them for five hundred crowns, for my resources are not great. I am quite sure that for a matter of a hundred crowns more you would not like me to have anything common. I am a beggar, as you know, in such sort that I cannot do much in the way of playing the opulent, but at any rate, when I have silver dishes, my nobility will be considerably enhanced." End quote. He succeeded, no doubt, in getting his silver dishes and his well-appointed episcopal mansion, for when in 1614 he was elected to the States general he had acquired amongst the clergy and at the court of Louis XIII sufficient importance to be charged with the duty of speaking, in presence of the king, on the acceptance of the acts of the Council of Trent, and on the restitution of certain property belonging to the Catholic Church in Vaughan he made skilful use of the occasion for the purpose of still further exalting and improving the question and his own position he complained that for a long time past ecclesiastics had been too rarely summoned to the sovereign's councils quote, as if the honour of serving god he said rendered them incapable of serving the king end quote he took care at the same time to make himself pleasant to the mighty ones of the hour he praised the young king for having on announcing his majority asked his mother to continue to watch over france and quote, to add to the august title of mother of the king that of mother of the kingdom end quote. the post of almoner to the queen regnant anne of austria was his reward he carried still further his ambitious foresight in february fifteen sixteen at the time when the session of the states general closed marshal d'ancre and leonora galigai were still favourites with the queen mother richelieu laid himself out to be pleasant to them and received from the marshal in sixteen sixteen the post of secretary of state for war and foreign affairs marshal d'ancre was at that time looking out for supporters against his imminent downfall when in sixteen seventeen he fell and was massacred people were astonished to find richelieu on good terms with the marshal's court rival albert de luynes who pressed him to remain in the council at which he had sat for only five months to what extent was the bishop of luson at that time on terms of understanding with the victor there is no saying but to accept the responsibility of the new favourite's accession was a compromising act richelieu judged it more prudent to remain bishop of luson and to wear the appearance of defeat by following mary de medici to blois whither since the fall of her favourites she had asked leave to retire he would there he said be more useful to the government of the young king for remaining at the side of mary de medici he would be able to advise her and restrain her he so completely persuaded louis the thirteenth and albert de luynes that he received orders to set out for blois with the queen mother which he did on the fourth of may sixteen seventeen the bishop of luson though still young was already one of the ambitious sort who stake their dignity upon the ultimate success of their fortunes success gained no matter at what price by address or by hardihood by complaisance or by opposition according to the requirements of facts and times dignity apart the young bishop had accurately measured the expediency of the step he was taking in the interest of his future high-soaring ambition on arriving at blois with the queen mother he began by dividing his life between that petty court in disgrace and his diocese of luson he wished to set albert de luynes at rest as to his presence at the court of mary de medici the devotion he showed her and the counsels he gave her he had but small success however the new favourite was suspicious and anxious richelieu appeared to be occupied with nothing but the duties of his office he presided at conferences and he published against the protestants a treatise entitled the complete christian or de la perfection du chrétien luynes was not disposed to believe in these exclusively religious preoccupations he urged upon the king that richelieu should not live constantly in the queen mother's neighbourhood and in june sixteen seventeen he had orders given him to retire to the courtship of avignon pope paul v complained that the bishop of luson was exiled from his diocese quote, what is to be done about residence said he which is due to his bishopric and what will the world say at seeing him prohibited from going whither his duty binds him to go End quote. the king answered that he was surprised at the pope's complaint quote, an ecclesiastic said he could not possibly be in any better place than avignon church territory my lord the bishop of luson is far from finding time for nothing but the exercises of his profession i have discovered that he indulged in practices prejudicial to my service he is one of those spirits that are carried away far beyond their duty and are very dangerous in times of public disorder richelieu obeyed without making any objection 
he passed two years at avignon protesting that he would never depart from it without the consent of luin and without the hope of serving him the favour and fortune of the young falconer went on increasing every day he had in sixteen seventeen married the daughter of the duke of montbasson and in sixteen nineteen prevailed upon the king to have the estate of Mai raised for him to a duchy peerage under the title of luin in sixteen twenty one he procured for himself the dignity of constable to which he had no military claim louis the thirteenth sometimes took a malicious pleasure in making fun of his favourite's cupidity and that of his following quote, i never saw said he one person with so many relatives they come to court by shiploads and not a single one of them with a silk dress quote, see said he one day to the count of bassompierre pointing to luin surrounded by a numerous following he wants to play the king but i shall know how to prevent it i will make him disgorge what he has taken from me friends at court warned luin of this language and luin replied with a somewhat disdainful impertinence quote, it is good for me to cause the king a little vexation from time to time it revives the affection he feels for me richelieu kept himself well informed of court rumours and was cautious not to treat them with indifference he took great pains to make himself pleasant to the young constable quote, my lord he wrote to him in august sixteen twenty one i am extremely pleased to have an opportunity of testifying to you that i shall never have any possession that i shall not be most happy to employ for the satisfaction of the king and yourself the queen did me the honour of desiring that i should have the abbey of redon but the moment i knew that the king and you my lord were desirous of disposing of it otherwise i gave it up with very good cheer in order that being in your hands you might gratify therewith whomsoever you pleased assuring you my lord that i have more contentment in testifying to you thereby that which you will on every occasion recognize in me than i should have had by an augmentation of four thousand crowns income the queen is very well thank god i think it will be very meet that from time to time by means of those who are passing you should send her news of the king and of you and yours which will give her great satisfaction letters of cardinal richelieu page six ninety whilst richelieu was thus behaving towards the favourite with complacence and modesty mary de medici whose mouthpiece he appeared to be assumed a very different posture and used different language she complained bitterly of the slavery and want of money to which she was reduced at blois a plot on the part of both aristocrats and domestics were contrived by those about her to extricate her she entered into secret relations with a great a turbulent and a malcontent lord the duke of epernon two florentine servants ruccellet and vincenti ludovici were their go-betweens and it was agreed that she should escape from blois and take refuge at angouleme a lordship belonging to the duke of epernon she at the same time wrote to the king to plead for more liberty he replied quote, madame having understood that you have a wish to visit certain places of devotion i am rejoiced thereat i shall be still more pleased if you take a resolution to move about and travel henceforward more than you have done in the past i consider that it will be of great service to your health which is extremely precious to me if business permitted me to be of the party i would accompany you with all my heart mary replied to him with formal assurances of fidelity and obedience she promised before god and his angels quote, to have no correspondence which could be prejudicial to the king's service to warn him of all intrigues which should come to her knowledge that were opposed to his will and to entertain no design of returning to court save when it should please the king to give her orders to do so there was between the king the queen mother albert de luin the duke of epernon and their agents an exchange of letters and empty promises which deceived scarcely anybody and which destroyed all confidence as well as all truthfulness between them the duke of epernon protested that he had no idea of disobeying the king's commands but that he thought his presence was more necessary for the king's service in angoumois than at metz he complained at the same time that for two years past he had received from the court only the simple pay of a colonel at ten months for the year which took it out of his power to live suitably to his rank he set out for metz at the end of january sixteen nineteen saying quote, i am going to take the boldest step i ever took in my life End quote. End of section seventeen Section 18 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. 
Chapter thirty seven Regency of Mary de Medici sixteen ten to sixteen seventeen Part three the queen mother made her exit from blois on the night between the twenty first and twenty second of february sixteen nineteen by her closet window against which a ladder had been placed for the descent to the terrace whence a second ladder was to enable her to descend right down on arriving at the terrace she found herself so fatigued and so agitated that she declared it would be impossible to avail herself of the second ladder she preferred to have herself let down upon a cloak to the bottom of the terrace which had a slight slant her two equerries escorted her along the faubourg to the end of the bridge some officers of her household saw her pass without recognizing her and laughed at meeting a woman between two men at night and with a somewhat agitated air Quote, they take me for a bona roba said the queen on arriving at the end of the faubourg of blois she did not find her carriage which was to have been waiting for her there when she had come up with it there was a casket missing which contained her jewels there was a hundred thousand crowns worth in it the casket had fallen out two hundred paces from the spot it was recovered and the queen mother got into her carriage and took the road to loches where the duke of epernon had been waiting for her since the day before he came to meet her with a hundred and fifty horsemen nobody in the household of mary de medici had observed her departure great was the rumours when her escape became known and greater still when it was learned in whose hands she had placed herself it was civil war said everybody at the commencement of the seventeenth century there were still two possible and even probable chances of civil war in france one between catholics and protestants and the other between what remained of the great feudal or quasi-feudal lords and the kingship which of the two wars was about to commence nobody knew on one side there was hesitation the most contradictory moves were made louis the thirteenth when he heard of his mother's escape tried first of all to disconnect her from the duke of epernon quote, i could never have imagined said he that there was any man who in time of perfect peace would have had the audacity i do not say to carry out but to conceive the resolution of making an attempt upon the mother of his king in order to release you from the difficulty you are in madame i have determined to take up arms to put you in possession of the liberty of which your enemies have deprived you and he marched troops and cannon to angoumois quote, many men says duke henry of rouen envied the duke of epernon his gallant deed but few were willing to submit themselves to his haughty temper and everybody having reason to believe that it would all end in a peace was careful not to embark in the affair merely to incur the king's hatred and leave to others the honours of the enterprise End quote. the king's troops were well received wherever they showed themselves the towns opened their gates to them quote, it needs said a contemporary mighty strong citadels to make the towns of france obey their governors when they see the latter disobedient to the king's will End quote. several great lords held themselves carefully aloof others determined to attempt an arrangement between the king and his mother it was known what influence over her continued to be preserved by the bishop of luçon still in exile at avignon he was pressed to return his confidant father joseph du tremblay was of opinion that he should and richelieu accordingly set out the governor of lyons had him arrested at vienne in dauphiny and was much surprised to find him armed with a letter from the king commanding that he should be allowed to pass freely everywhere richelieu was prepared to advise a reconciliation between king and queen mother and the king was as much disposed to exert himself to that end as the queen mother's friends at limoges the bishop of luçon was obliged to carefully avoid count schomberg commandant of the royal troops who was not at all in the secret of the negotiation when he arrived at angers a fresh difficulty supervened the most daring of the queen mother's domestic advisers rucellai had conceived a hatred of the bishop and tried to exclude him from the privy council richelieu let be quote, certain as he said that they would soon fall back upon him end quote he was one of the patient as well as ambitious who can calculate upon success even afar off and wait for it the duke of epernon supported him rucellai defeated left the queen mother taking with him some of her most warmly attached servants when the subordinates were gone recourse was had accordingly to richelieu on the tenth of august sixteen nineteen he concluded at angouleme between the king and his mother a treaty whereby the king promised to consign to oblivion all that had passed since blois the queen mother consented to exchange her government of touraine against that of anjou and the duke of epernon received from the town of boulogne fifty thousand crowns in recompense for what he had done and he wrote to the king to protest his fidelity 
the queen mother still hesitated to see her son but at his entreaty she at last sent off the bishop of lucon from angouleme to make preparations for the interview and five days afterwards she set out herself accompanied by the duke of epernon who halted at the limits of his own government not caring to come to any closer quarters with so recently reconciled a court the king received his mother according to some in the little town of coussieres and according to others at tours or amboise they embraced with tears quote, god bless me my boy how you are grown said the queen quote, in order to be of more service to you mother answered the king the cheers of the people hailed their reconciliation not without certain signs of disquietude on the part of the favourite albert de luynes who was an eye-witness after the interview the king set out for paris again and mary de medici returned to her government of anjou to take possession of it promising she said to rejoin her son subsequently at paris du plessis mornay wrote to one of his friends at court quote, if you do not get the queen along with you you have done nothing at all distrust will increase with absence the malcontents will multiply and the honest servants of the king will have no little difficulty in managing to live between them End quote how to live between mother and son without being committed to one or the other was indeed the question a difficult task for three months the courtiers were equal to it from may to july sixteen nineteen the court and the government were split in two the king at paris or at tours the queen mother at angers or at blois two eminent men richelieu amongst the catholics and du plessis mornay amongst the protestants advised them strongly and incessantly to unite again to live and to govern together Quote, apply yourself to winning the king's good graces said richelieu to the queen mother support on every occasion the interests of the public without speaking of your own take the side of equity against that of favour without attacking the favourites and without appearing to envy their influence mornay used the same language to the protestants quote, do not wear out the king's patience he said to them there is no patience without limits End quote. louis the thirteenth listened to them without allowing himself to be persuaded by them the warlike spirit was striving within the young man he was brave and loved war as war rather than for political reasons the grand provost of normandy was advising him one day not to venture in person into his province saying quote, you will find there nothing but revolt and disagreeables quote, though the roads were all paved with arms answered the king i would march over the bellies of my foes for they have no cause to declare against me who have offended nobody you shall have the pleasure of seeing it you served the late king my father too well not to rejoice at it the queen mother on her side was delighted to see herself surrounded at angers by a brilliant court and the dukes of longueville of la tremoille of retz of rouen of mayenne of epernon and of nemours promised her numerous troops and effectual support she might nevertheless have found many reasons to doubt and wait for proofs the king moved upon normandy and his quartermasters came to assign quarters at rouen quote, where have you left the king asked the duke of longueville quote, at pontoise my lord but he is by this time far advanced and is to sleep to-night at magny quote, where do you mean to quarter him here asked the duke quote, in the house where you are my lord quote, it is right that i yield him place said the duke and the very same evening took the road back to the district of caux it was under this aspect of public feeling that an embassy from the king and a pacific mission from rome came without any success to ranger and that on the fourth of july sixteen nineteen a fresh civil war between the king and the partisans of the queen mother was declared it was short and not very bloody though pretty vigorously contested the two armies met at pont de c they had not either of them any orders or any desire to fight and pacific negotiations were opened at la fleche the queen mother declared that she had made up her mind to live henceforth at her son's court and that all she desired was to leave honourably the party with which she was engaged that was precisely the difficulty the king also declared himself resolved to receive his mother affectionately but he required her to abandon the lords of her party and that was what she could not make up her mind to do in the unpremeditated conflict that took place at pont de c the troops of the queen mother were beaten quote, they had two hundred men killed or drowned says bassompierre and about as many taken prisoners End quote. this reverse silenced the queen's scruples there was clearly no imperative cause for war between her and the king and the queen's partisans could not be blind to the fact that if the struggle were prolonged they would be beaten the kingship had the upper hand in the country and a consent was given to the desired arrangements quote, 
assure the king that i will go and see him to-morrow at brissac said the queen-mother i am perfectly satisfied with him and all i think of is to please him and pray god for him personally and for the prosperity of his kingdom the treaty was concluded at angers on the tenth of august sixteen twenty the queen-mother returned to paris and the civil war at court was evidently not put an end to never to recur but stricken with feebleness and postponed two men of mark albert de luynes and richelieu came out of this crisis well content the favourite felicitated himself on the king's victory over the queen-mother for he might consider the triumph as his own he had advised and supported the king's steady resistance to his mother's enterprises besides he had gained by it the rank and power of constable it was at this period that he obtained them thanks to the retirement of lady guerre who gave them up to assume the title of marshal-general of the king's camps and armies the royal favour did not stop there for luynes the keeper of the seals duvert died in sixteen twenty one and the king handed over the seals to the new constable who thus united the military authority with that of justice without being either a great warrior or a great lawyer all he had to do was to wait for an opportunity of displaying his double power the defaults of the french protestants soon supplied one in july fifteen sixty seven henry the fourth's mother jeanne d'albret on becoming queen of navarre had at the demand of the estates of bern proclaimed calvinism as the sole religion of her petty kingdom all catholic worship was expressly forbidden there religious liberty which protestants everywhere invoked was proscribed in bern moreover ecclesiastical property was confiscated there the catholics complained loudly the kings of france were supporters of their plaint it had been for a long time past repudiated or eluded but on the thirteenth of august sixteen twenty louis the thirteenth issued two edicts for the purpose of restoring in bern free catholic worship and making restitution of their property to the ecclesiastical establishments the council of pau which had at first repudiated them hastened to enregister these edicts in the hope of retarding at least their execution but the king said quote, in two days i shall be at pau you want me there to assist your weakness End quote. he was asked how he would be received at pau quote, a sovereign of varne said he i will dismount first of all at the church if there be one but if not i want no canopy or ceremonial entry it would not become me to receive honours in a place where i have never been before giving thanks to god from whom i hold all my dominions and all my power religious liberty was thus re-established at pau Quote, it is the king's intention said the duke of montmorency to the protestants of villeneuve de bergues who asked that they might enjoy the liberty promised them by the edicts that all his subjects catholic or protestant be equally free in the exercise of their religion you shall not be hindered in yours and i will take good care that you do not hinder the catholics in theirs the duke of montmorency did not foresee that the son and successor of the king in whose name he was so energetically proclaiming religious liberty louis the fourteenth would abolish the edict of nantes whereby his grandfather henry the fourth had founded it justice and iniquity are often all but contemporary it has just been said that not only luynes but richelieu too had come well content out of the crisis brought about by the struggle between louis the thirteenth and the queen mother richelieu's satisfaction was neither so keen nor so speedy as the favourites pope paul v had announced for the eleventh of january sixteen twenty one a promotion of ten cardinals at the news of this the queen-mother sent an express courier to rome with an urgent demand that the bishop of luçon should be included in the promotion the marquis of coeuvre ambassador of france at rome insisted rather strongly in the name of the queen-mother and of the duke of luynes from whom he showed the pope some very pressing letters the pope in surprise gave him a letter to read in the handwriting of king louis the thirteenth saying that he did not at all wish the bishop of luçon to become cardinal and begging that no notice might be taken of any recommendations which should be forwarded on the subject the ambassador greatly surprised in his turn ceased to insist it was evidently the doing of the duke of luynes who jealous of the bishop of luçon and dreading his influence had demanded and obtained from the king this secret measure it was effectual and at the beginning of the year sixteen twenty one richelieu had but a vague hope of the hat he had no idea when he heard of this check that at the end of a few months luynes would undergo one graver still would die almost instantaneously after having practised a policy analogous to that which richelieu was himself projecting and would leave the road open for him to obtain the cardinal's hat and once more enter into the counsels of the king who however said to the queen-mother i know him better than you madame he is a man of unbounded ambition 
the two victories won in 1620 by the Duke of Luynes, won over the Protestants by the re-establishment in Varn of free worship for the Catholics, and the other over his secret rival Richelieu by preventing him from becoming cardinal, had inspired him with great confidence in his good fortune. He resolved to push it with more boldness than he had yet shown. He purposed to subdue the Protestants as a political party whilst respecting their religious creed, and to reduce them to a condition of subjection in the state whilst leaving them free, as Christians, in the church. A fundamentally contradictory problem, for the different liberties are closely connected one with another, and have need to be security one for another, but at the commencement of the seventeenth century people were not so particular in point of consequence, and it was thought possible to give religious liberty its guarantees whilst refusing them to general political liberty. That is what the Duke of Luynes attempted to do. To all the towns to which Henry the Fourth had bound himself by the Edict of Nantes, he made a promise of preserving to them their religious liberties, and he called upon them at the same time to remain submissive and faithful subjects of the sovereign kingship. La Rochelle, Montauban, Saumur, Sancerre, Charité-sur-Loire, and Saint-Jean-d'Angély were in this category, and it was to Montauban, as one of the most important of those towns, that Louis the Thirteenth first addressed his promise and his appeal, inconsistent one with the other. Some years previously, in May 1610, amidst the grief and anxiety awakened by the assassination of Henry the Fourth by Ravaillac, the population of Montauban had maintained and testified a pacific and moderate disposition. The Synod was in assembly when the news of the King's death arrived there. We read in the report of the Town Council, under date of May 19, 1610, quote, the ecclesiastics or catholic having come to the council the consuls gave them every assurance for their persons and property and took them under the protection and safeguard of the king and the town without suffering or permitting any hurt wrong or displeasure to be done them the ecclesiastics thanked them and protested their desire to live and die in that town as good townsmen and servants of the king End quote. On the 22nd of May, in a larger council general, the council gives notice to the Parliament of Toulouse that everything shall remain peaceable. Consul Berrault moves that, quote, Every one take forthwith the oath of fidelity we owe to His Majesty, and that every one also testify by acclamation his wishes and desires for the prosperity and duration of his reign. End, quote. End of section 18. Section 19 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 37. Regency of Mary de' Medici, 1610-1617, Part 4. Ten years later, in 1620, the disposition of the Protestants was very much changed. Distrust and irritation had once more entered into their hearts. Henry the Fourth was no longer there to appease them or hold them in. The restoration of the freedom of Catholic worship in Varn had alarmed and offended them as a violation of their own exclusive right proclaimed by Jeanne d'Albret in january sixteen twenty one during an assembly held at la rochelle they exclaimed violently against what they called quote, the woes experienced by their brethren of varne end quote. louis the thirteenth considered their remonstrances too arrogant to be tolerated on the twenty fourth of april sixteen twenty one by a formal declaration he confirmed all the edicts issued in favour of the liberty of protestants but with a further announcement that he would put down with all the rigour of the laws those who did not remain submissive and tranquil in the enjoyment of their own rights this measure produced amongst the protestants a violent schism some submitted and their chiefs gave up to the king the places they commanded on the 10th of May, 1621, Saumur opened her gates to him. Others, more hot-tempered and more obstinate, persisted in their remonstrances. La Rochelle, Montauban, and Saint-Jean d'Angely took that side. Duke Henry of Rohan and the Duke of Soubise, his brother, supported them in their resistance. Rohan went to Montauban, and mounting into the pulpit, said to the assembly, quote, I will not conceal from you that the most certain conjecture which can be formed from the current news is that in a short time the royal army will camp around your walls, since Saint-Jean d'Angely is surrendered, and all that remains up to here is weakened, broken down, and ready to receive the yoke, through the factions of certain evil spirits. I have no fear lest the consternation and cowardice of the rest should reach by contagion to you. In days past you swore in my presence the union of the churches. Of a surety we will get peace restored to you here. 
i pray you to have confidence in me that on this occasion i will not desert you whatever happen though there should be but two men left of my religion i will be one of the two my houses and my revenues are seized because i would not bow beneath the proclamation i have my sword and my life left three stout hearts are better than thirty that quail End quote. The whole assembly vehemently cheered this fiery speech. The premier consul of Montauban, Dupuis, swore to live and die in the cause of union of the churches. Quote, the Duke of Rouen exerted himself to place Montauban in a position to oppose a vigorous resistance to the royal troops. Consul Dupuis, for his part, was at the same time collecting munitions and victuals. End quote. It was announced that the king's army was advancing, and reports were spread with the usual exaggeration of the deeds of violence it was already committing. At the news thereof, every nerve is strained to advance the fortifications. Quote, there is none that shirks of whatever age or sex or condition. Every other occupation ceases. Night serves to render the day's work bigger. The inhabitants are all a sweat, soiled with dust, laden with earth. End quote whilst the multitude was thus working pell-mell to put the town substantially in a state of defence the warlike population gentlemen and burgesses were arming and organizing for the struggle they had chosen for their chief a younger son of sully's baron d'orval devoted to the protestant cause even to the extent of rebellion whilst his elder brother the marquis of rosny was serving in the royal army their aged father, Sully, went to Montauban to counsel peace, not that he exactly blamed the resistance, but he said that it would be vain, and that a peace on good terms was possible. He was listened to with respect, though he was not believed, and though the struggle was all the while persisted in. The royal army, with a strength of twenty thousand men, and commanded by the young Duke of Mayenne, son of the great leaguer, came up on the 18th of August, 1621, to besiege Montauban, with its population of from fifteen thousand to twenty thousand. Besiegers and besieged were all of them brave, the former the more obstinate, the latter the more hare-brained and rash. The siege lasted two months and a half, with alternate successes and reverses the people of the town were directed and supported by commissions charged with the duty of collecting meal preparing quarters for the troops looking after the sick and wounded and distributing ammunition Quote, day and night from hour to hour one of the consuls went to inspect these services all was done without confusion without a murmur End quote. ministers of the reformed church to the number of thirteen were charged to keep up the enthusiasm with chants psalms and prayers one of them the pastor chamier was animated by a zealous and bellicose fanaticism he was never tired of calling to mind the calamities undergone by the towns that had submitted to the royal army he was incessantly comparing montauban to bethulia louis the thirteenth to nabuchodonosor the duke of mayenne to Holofernes, the montalbanese to the people of god and the catholics to the assyrians the indecision and diversity of views in the royal camp formed a singular contrast to the firm resolution enthusiasm and union which prevailed in the town on the sixteenth and seventeenth of august the king passed his army in review several captains were urgent in dissuading him from prosecuting the siege they proposed to build forts around montauban and leave there the duke of mayenne quote, to harass the inhabitants make them consume both their gunpowder and their tooth-powder and peradventure bring them to a composition end quote. but the self-respect of the king and of the army was compromised the duke of luynes ardently desired to change his name for that of duke of montauban there was promise of help from the prince of conde and the duke of vendome who were commanding one in berry and the other in brittany these personal interests and sentiments carried the day the siege was pushed forward with ardour although without combined effort the duke of mayenne was killed there on the sixteenth of september sixteen twenty one and amongst the insurgents the preacher chamier met on the seventeenth of october the same fate it was in the royal army and the government that fatigue and the desire of putting a stop to a struggle so costly and of such doubtful issue first began to be manifested and at the outset in the form of attempts of negotiation the duke of luynes himself had a proposal made to the duke of rohan who was in residence at castres for an interview which rohan accepted notwithstanding the mistrust of the people of castres and of the majority of his friends the conference was held at a league's distance from montauban after the proper compliments luynes drew rohan aside into an alley alone and quote, i thank you he said for having put trust in me you shall not find it misplaced your safety is as great here as in castres having become connected with you i desire your welfare but you deprived me whilst my favour lasted of the means of procuring the greatness of your house 
you have succoured montauban in the very teeth of your king it is a great feather in your cap but you must not make too much of it it is time to act for yourself and your friends the king will make no general peace treat for them who acknowledge you represent to them of montauban that their ruin is but deferred for a few days that you have no means of helping them for castres and other places in your department ask what you will and you shall obtain it for your own self anything you please carte blanche is offered you if you will believe me you will get out of this miserable business with glory with the good graces of the king and with what you desire for your own fortunes which i am anxious to promote so as to be a support to mine rohan replied quote, i should be my own enemy if i did not desire my king's good graces and your friendship i will never refuse from my king benefits and honours or from you the offices of a kind connection i do well consider the peril in which i stand but i beg you also to look at yours you are universally hated because you alone possess what everybody desires wars against them of the religion have often commenced with great disadvantages for them but the restlessness of the french spirit the discontent of those not in the government and the influence of foreigners have often retrieved them if you manage to make the king grant us peace it will be to his great honour and advantage for after having humbled the party without having received any check and without any appearance of division within or assistance from without he shall have shown that he is not set against the religion but only against the disobedience it covers and he will break the neck of other parties without having met with anything disagreeable but if you push things to extremity and the torrent of your successes does not continue and you are on the eve of seeing it stopped in front of montauban every one will recover his as yet flurried senses and will give you a difficult business to unravel bethink you that you have gathered in the harvest of all that promises mingled with threats could enable you to gain and that the remnant is fighting for the religion in which it believes for my own part i have made up my mind to the loss of my property and my posts if you have retarded the effects thereof on account of our connection i am obliged to you for it but i am quite prepared to suffer everything since my mind is made up having solemnly promised it and my conscience so bidding me to hear of nothing but a general peace the reply was worthy of a great soul devoted to a great cause a soul that would not sacrifice to the hopes of fortune either friends or creed it was a mark of duke henry of rohan's superior character to take account before everything of the general interests and the moral sentiments of his party the chief of the royal party the duke of luynes was on the contrary absorbed in the material and momentary success of his own personal policy he refused to treat for a general peace with the protestants and he preferred to submit to a partial and local defeat before montauban rather than be hampered with the difficulties of national pacification at a council held on the twenty sixth of october sixteen twenty one it was decided to publicly raise the siege the king and the royal army departed in november from the precincts of montauban which they purposed to attack afresh on the return of spring the king was in a hurry to go and receive at toulouse the empty acclamations of the mob and he ordered luin to go and take on the little town of monard in the neighbourhood of toulouse a specious revenge for his check before montauban monard surrendered on the eleventh of december sixteen twenty one another little village in the neighbourhood negrepelisse which offered resistance to the royal army was taken by assault and its population infamously massacred but in the midst of these insignificant victories on the fourteenth of december sixteen twenty one the royal favourite the constable interim keeper of the seals duke albert of luynes had an attack of malignant fever and died in three days at the camp of longueville Quote, what was marvellously surprising and gave a good idea of the world and its vanity says his contemporary the marquis of fontaine mireuil was that this man so great and so powerful found himself nevertheless to such a degree abandoned and despised that for two days during which he was in agony there was scarcely one of his people who would stay in his room the door being open all the time and anybody who pleased coming in as if he had been the most insignificant of men and when his body was taken to be interred i suppose to his duchy of luynes instead of priests to go pray for him i saw some of his valets playing piquet on his beer whilst they were having their horses baited it was not long before magnificence revisited the favourite's beer quote, on the eleventh of january sixteen twenty two his mortal remains having arrived at tours all the religious bodies went out to receive it the constable was placed in a chariot drawn by six horses accompanied by pages swiss and gentlemen in mourning 
he was finally laid in the cathedral church where there took place a service which was attended by marshal de la diguiere the greatest lords of the court the judicature and the corporation it is a contemporary sheet the mercure francais which has preserved to us these details as to the posthumous grandeur of albert de luynes after the brutal indifference to which he had been subjected at the moment of his death his brothers after him held a high historical position which the family have maintained through the course of every revolution to the present day a position which m cousin took pleasure in calling to mind and which the last duke but one of luynes made it a point of duty to commemorate by raising to louis the thirteenth a massive silver statue almost as large as life the work of that able sculptor m rude which figured at the public exhibition set on foot by count d'ossonville in honour of the alsace lorrainers whom the late disasters of france drove off in exile to algeria richelieu when he had become cardinal premier minister of louis the thirteenth and of the government of france passed a just but severe judgment upon albert de luynes Quote, he was a mediocre and timid creature he said faithless ungenerous too weak to remain steady against the assault of so great a fortune as that which ruined him incontinently allowing himself to be borne away by it as by a torrent without any foothold unable to set bounds to his ambition incapable of arresting it and not knowing what he was about like a man on top of a tower whose head goes round and who has no longer any power of discernment he would fain have been prince of orange count of avignon duke of albret king of austrasia and would not have refused more if he had seen his way to it memoire de richelieu page one sixty nine in the petitot collection series five this brilliant and truthful portrait lacks one feature which was the merit of the constable of luynes he saw coming and he anticipated a long way off and to little purpose but heartily enough the government of france by a supreme kingship whilst paying respect as long as he lived to religious liberty and showing himself favourable to intellectual and literary liberty though he was opposed to political and national liberty that was the government which after him was practised with a high hand and rendered triumphant by cardinal richelieu to the honour if not the happiness of france End of chapter thirty seven Section twenty of a popular history of France, volume five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume five, by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty eight Louis the thirteenth, Cardinal Richelieu, and the court, sixteen twenty two to sixteen forty two, part one the characteristic of louis the fourteenth's reign is the uncontested empire of the sovereign over the nation the authority of the court throughout the country all intellectual movement proceeded from the court or radiated about it the whole government whether for war or peace was concentrated in its hands conde turenne catina luxembourg villars vendome belonged as well as louvois or colbert to the court from the court went the governors and administrators of provinces there was no longer any greatness existing outside of the court there were no longer any petty private courts as for the state the king was it for ages past france had enjoyed the rare good fortune of seeing her throne successively occupied by charlemagne and charles v by saint louis and louis the eleventh by louis the twelfth francis the first and henry the fourth great conquerors or wise administrators heroic saints or profound politicians brilliant knights or models of patriot kings such sovereigns had not only governed but also impressed the imagination of the people it was to them that the weak oppressed by the great feudal lords had little by little learned to apply for support and assistance since the reign of francis i especially in the midst of the religious struggles which had caused division amongst the noblesse and were threatening to create a state within the state the personal position of the grandees and that of their petty private courts had been constantly diminishing in importance the wise policy the bold and prudent courage of henry the fourth and his patriotic foresight had pacified hatred and stayed civil wars he had caused his people to feel the pleasure and pride of being governed by a man of a superior order cardinal richelieu more stern than henry the fourth set his face steadily against all the influences of the great lords he broke them down one after another he persistently elevated the royal authority it was the hand of richelieu which made the court and paved the way for the reign of louis the fourteenth the fronde was but a paltry interlude and a sanguinary game between parties at richelieu's death pure monarchy was founded 
in the month of december sixteen twenty two the work was as yet full of difficulty there were numerous rivals for the heritage of royal favour that had slipped from the dying hands of luynes the prince of conde a man of ability and moderation quote, a good managing man or homme de bon menage end quote, as he was afterwards called by the cardinal was the first to get the possession of the mind of the king at that time away from his mother who was residing at paris quote, it was not so much from dislike that they opposed her says richelieu as from fear lest when once established at the king's council she might wish to introduce me there they acknowledged in me some force of judgment they dreaded my wits fearing lest if the king were to take special cognizance of me it might come to his committing to me the principal care of his affairs memoire de richelieu page one ninety three on returning to paris the king nevertheless could not refuse this gratification to his mother however quote, the prince who was in the habit of speaking very freely and could not be mum about what he had on his mind permitted himself to go so far as to say that she had been received into the council on two conditions one that she should have cognizance of nothing but what they pleased and the other that though only a portion of affairs was communicated to her she would serve as authority for all in the minds of the people memoire de richelieu page one ninety four in fact, the Queen Mother quite perceived that she was only shown the articles in the window and did not enter the shop. Quote, but with all the prudence and patience of an Italian, when she was not carried away by passion, she knew how to practice dissimulation towards the Prince of Condé and his allies, Chancellor Sillery and his son Puissieux, Secretary of State. End quote she accompanied her son on an expedition against the huguenots of the south which she had not advised quote, foreseeing quite well that if she were separated from the king she would have no part either in peace or war and that if they got on without her for ten months they would become accustomed to getting on without her End quote. she had the satisfaction of at last seeing the bishop of luçon promoted to the cardinalship she had so often solicited for him in vain but at the same time the king called to the council cardinal rochefoucauld quote, not through personal esteem for the old cardinal says richelieu but to cut off from the new one all hope of a place for which he might be supposed to feel some ambition End quote. nevertheless in spite of his enemies' intrigues, in spite of a certain instinctive repugnance on the part of the king himself, who repeated to his mother, quote, I know him better than you, madame. He is a man of unbounded ambition. End quote. Quote, the quote, new cardinal end quote, was called to the council at the opening of the year 1624, on the instance of the Marquis of La Vieuxville, superintendent of finance and chief of the council, who felt himself unsteady in his position, and sought to secure the favor of the queen mother it was as the protege and organ of mary de medici that the cardinal wrote to the prince of conde on the eleventh of may sixteen twenty four quote, the king having done me the honour to place me on his council i pray god with all my heart to render me worthy of serving him as i desire and i feel myself bound thereto by every sort of consideration i cannot sufficiently thank you for the satisfaction that you have been pleased to testify to me thereat therefore would i far rather do so indeed by serving you than by bootless words and in that i cannot fail without failing to follow out the king's intention i have made known to the queen the assurance you give her by your letter of your affection for which she feels all the reciprocity you can desire she is the more ready to flatter herself with the hope of its continuance in that she will be very glad to incite you thereto by all the good offices she has means of rendering you with his majesty End quote. Lettre du Cardinal de Richelieu, page 5. On the 12th of August, however, M. de la Vieuxville fell irretrievably and was confined in the castle of Amboise. A pamphlet of the time had forewarned him of the danger which threatened him when he introduced Richelieu into the council. Quote, you are both of the same temper, it said. That is, you both desire one and the same thing, which is to be, each of you, sole governor. That which you believe to be your making will be your undoing. End quote from that moment the cardinal in spite of his modest resistance based upon the state of his health became the veritable chief of the council quote, everybody knew that amidst the mere private occupations he had hitherto had it would have been impossible for him to exist with such poor health unless he took frequent recreation in the country memoire de richelieu page two eighty nine turning his attention to founding his power and making himself friends he authorized the recall of count schomberg lately disgraced and of the duke of anjou's the king's brothers governor colonel ornano imprisoned by the marquis of la vieuxville 
he at the same time stood out against the danger of concentrating all the power of the government in a single pair of hands Quote, your majesty he said ought not to confide your public business to a single one of your councillors and hide it from the rest those whom you have chosen ought to live in fellowship and amity in your service not in partisanship and division every time and as many times as a single one wants to do everything himself he wants to ruin himself but in ruining himself he will ruin your kingdom and you and as often as any single one wants to possess your ear and do in secret what should be resolved upon openly it must necessarily be for the purpose of concealing from your majesty either his ignorance or his wickedness memoire de richelieu page three forty nine prudent rules and acute remarks which richelieu when he became all-powerful was to forget eighteen months had barely rolled away when colonel ornano lately created a marshal at the duke of anjou's request was again arrested and carried off a prisoner quote, to the very room where twenty-four years ago marshal biron had been confined end quote for some time past quote, it had been current at court and throughout the kingdom that a great cabal was going on says richelieu in his memoir and the cabalists said quite openly that under his ministry men might cabal with impunity for he was not a dangerous enemy End quote. if the cabalists had been living in that confidence they were most woefully deceived richelieu was neither meddlesome nor cruel but he was stern and pitiless towards the sufferings as well as the supplications of those who sought to thwart his policy at this period he wished to bring about a marriage between the duke of anjou then eighteen years old and mademoiselle de montpensier the late duke of montpensier's daughter and the richest heiress in france the young prince did not like it madame de chevreuse it was said seeing the king an invalid and childless was already anticipating his death and the possibility of marrying his widowed queen to his successor Quote, i should gain too little by the change said anne of austria one day irritated by the accusations of which she was the object diverse secret or avowed motives had formed about the duke of anjou what was called the quote unquote, aversion party who were opposed to his marriage but the arrest of colonel ornano dismayed the accomplices for a while the duke of anjou protested his fidelity to his brother and promised the cardinal to place in the king's hands a written undertaking to submit his wishes and affections to him the intrigue appeared to have been abandoned but the quote, dreadful or epouvantable faction as the cardinal calls it in his memoir conspired to remove the young prince from the court the duke of vendome son of henry the fourth and gabriel d'estrees had offered him an asylum in his government of brittany but the far-sighted policy of the minister took away this refuge from the heir to the throne always inclined as he was to put himself at the head of a party the duke of vendome and his brother the grand prior disquieted at the rumours which were current about them hastened to go and visit the king at blois he received them with great marks of affection Quote, brother said he to the duke of vendome laying his hand upon his shoulder i was impatient to see you next morning the fifteenth of june the two princes were arrested in bed Quote, ah brother cried vendome did i not tell you in brittany that we should be arrested Quote, i wish we were dead and you were there said the grand prior Quote, i told you you know that the castle of blois was a fatal place for princes rejoined the duke they were conducted to amboise the king continually disquieted by the projects of assassination hatched against his minister gave him a company of musketeers as guards and set off for nantes whither the cardinal was not slow to go and join him in the interval a fresh accomplice in the plot had been discovered this time it was in the king's own household that he had been sought and found henry de talleyrand count of chalet master of the wardrobe hair-brained and frivolous had hitherto made himself talked about only for his duels and his successes with women he had already been drawn into a plot against the cardinal's life but under the influence of remorse he had confessed his criminal intentions to the minister himself richelieu appeared touched by the repentance but he did not forget the offence and his watch over this quote, unfortunate gentleman unquote, as he himself calls him made him aware before long that chalet was compromised in an intrigue which aimed at nothing less it was said than to secure the person of the cardinal by means of an ambush so as to rid him at need chalet was arrested in his bed on the eighth of july the marquis la valette son of the duke of epernon and governor of metz had been asked to give an asylum to monsieur in case he decided upon flying from the court had answered after embarrassed fashion 
the cardinal had his enemies in a trap he went to call on monsieur it was in richelieu's own house and under pretext of demanding hospitality of him that the conspirators calculated upon striking their blow Quote, i very much regret said the cardinal to gaston that your highness did not warn me that you and your friends meant to do me the honour of coming to sup with me i would have exerted myself to entertain them and receive them to the best of my ability End quote. journal de bassompierre monsieur seemed to be dumbfounded he still thought of flight but madame de guise had just arrived at nantes with her daughter mademoiselle de bonpensier madame de chevreuse had been driven from court the young prince's friends had been scared or won over and president le coigneux his most honest adviser counselled him to get the cardinal's support with the king Quote, that rascal said the president gets so sharp an edge on his wits that it is necessary to avail oneself of all sorts of means to undo what he does End quote. monsieur at last gave way and consented to be buried provided that the king would treat it as apanage louis the thirteenth in his turn hesitated being attracted by the arguments of certain underlings quote, folks ever welcome as being apparently out of the region of political interests and seeming to have an eye in everything to their master's person only End quote. they represented to the king that if the duke of anjou were to have children he would become of more importance in the country which would be to the king's detriment the minister boldly demanded of the king the dismissal of quote, those petty folks who insolently abused his ear. End quote. Louis the thirteenth in his turn gave way, and on the fifth of August, sixteen twenty six, the cardinal celebrated the marriage of Gaston, who became Duke of Orleans on the occasion, with Mary of Bourbon, Mademoiselle de Bonpensier. No vials or music were heard that day, and it was said in the bridegroom's circle that there was no occasion for having Monsieur's marriage stained with blood. This was reported to the king and to the cardinal, who did not at all like it. When Chalet in his prison heard of the marriage, he undoubtedly conceived some hope of a pardon, for he exclaimed, as the cardinal himself says, quote, That is a mighty sharp trick to have not only scattered a great faction, but by removing its object to have annihilated all hopes of reuniting it. Only the sagacity of the king and his minister could have made such a hit. It was well done to have caught Monsieur between touch and go, or entre bon des volets. The prince, when he knows of this, will be very vexed, though he do not say so, and the count of Soissons, nephew of Condé, will weep over it with his mother. End quote. The hopes of Chalet were deceived. He had written to the king to confess his fault. Quote, I was only thirteen days in the faction, he said, but those thirteen days were enough to destroy him. In vain did his friends intercede passionately for him. In vain did his mother write to the king the most touching letter. Quote, I gave him to you, sir, at eight years of age. He is a grandson of Marshal Montluc and President Jeannin. His family serve you daily, but dare not throw themselves at your feet for fear of displeasing you nevertheless they join with me in begging of you the life of this wretch though he should have to end his days in perpetual imprisonment or in serving you abroad chalet was condemned to death on the eighteenth of august sixteen twenty six by the criminal court established at nantes for that purpose all the king's mercy went no farther than a remission of the tortures which should have accompanied the execution he sent one of his friends to assure his mother of his repentance quote, tell him answered the noble lady that i am very glad to have the consolation he gives me of his dying in god if i did not think that the sight of me would be too much for him i would go to him and not leave him until his head was severed from his body but being unable to be of any help to him in that way i am going to pray god for him and she returned into the church of the nuns of st clair the friends of chalet had managed to have the executioner carried off so as to retard his execution but an inferior criminal to whom pardon had been granted for the performance of this service cut off the unfortunate culprit's head in thirty-one strokes memoire d'un favori du Luc d'orleans archive curieuse de l'histoire de france second series Quote, the sad news was brought to the duke of orleans who was playing abbot he did not leave the game and went on as if instead of death he had heard of deliverance End quote. An example of cruelty which might well have discouraged the friends of the Duke of Orléans quote, from dying a martyr's death for him, end quote, like the unhappy Chalet. It has been said that Richelieu was neither meddlesome nor cruel, but that he was stern and pitiless, and he gave proof of that the following year, on an occasion when his personal interests were not in any way at stake. At the outset of his ministry in 1624, he had obtained from the king a severe ordinance against duels, a fatal custom which was at that time decimating the noblesse. 
already several noblemen amongst others m du plessis praslin had been deprived of their offices or sent into exile in consequence of their duels when m de bouteville of the house of montmorency who had been previously engaged in twenty-one affairs of honour came to paris to fight the marquis of beuvron on the place royale the marquis's second m de fussy d'amboise was killed by the count of chapelle bouteville's second beuvron fled to england m de bouteville and his comrade had taken post for lorraine they were recognized and arrested at vitry le brule and brought back to paris and the king immediately ordered parliament to bring them to trial the crime was flagrant and the defiance of the king's orders undeniable but the culprit was connected with the greatest houses in the kingdom he had given striking proofs of bravery in the king's service and all the court interceded for him parliament with regret pronounced condemnation absolving the memory of bussy d'amboise who was a son of president de mem's wife and reducing to one-third of their goods the confiscation to which the condemned were sentenced Quote, parliament has played the king was openly said in the queen's antechamber if the things proceed to execution the king will play parliament Quote, the cardinal was much troubled in spirit says he himself it was impossible to have a noble heart and not pity this poor gentleman whose youth and courage excited so much compassion however whilst expounding according to his practice to the king the reasons for and against the execution of the culprits richelieu let fall this astounding expression quote, it is a question of breaking the neck of duels or of your majesty's edicts End quote louis the thirteenth did not hesitate though less stern than his brother he was more indifferent and quote, the love he bore his kingdom prevailed over his compassion for these two gentlemen End quote. both died with courage quote, there was no sign of anything weak in their words or mean in their actions they received the news that they were to die with the same visage as they would have had that of pardon Quote, in such sort that they who had lived like devils were seen dying like saints and they who had cared for nothing but to foment duels serving towards the extinction of them memoire d'un favori du duc d'orleans archive curieuse de l'histoire de france End of section twenty section twenty one of a popular history of france volume five this librivox recording is in the public domain a popular history of france from the earliest times volume five by francois guizot translated by robert black chapter thirty eight louis the thirteenth cardinal richelieu and the court sixteen twenty two to sixteen forty two part two the cardinal had got chalet condemned as a conspirator he had let bouteville be executed as a duellist the greatest lords bent beneath his authority but the power that depends on a king's favour is always menaced and tottering the enemies of richelieu had not renounced the idea of overthrowing him their hopes even went on growing since for some time past the queen-mother had been waxing jealous of the all-powerful minister and no longer made common cause with him the king had returned in triumph from the siege of la rochelle the queen-mother hoped to retain him by her at court but the cardinal ever on the watch over the movements of spain prevailed upon louis the thirteenth to support his subject the duke of nevers legitimate heir to mantua and montferrat of which the spaniards were besieging the capital the army began to march but the queen designedly retarded the movements of her son the cardinal was appointed generalissimo and the king who had taken upon himself the occupation of savoy was before long obliged by his health to return to lyons where he fell seriously ill the two queens hurried to his bedside and they were seconded by the keeper of the seals m de marillac but lately raised to power by richelieu as a man on whom he could depend and now completely devoted to the queen mother's party at the news of the king's danger the cardinal quitted st jean de maurienne for a precipitate journey to lyons but he was soon obliged to return to his army during the king's convalescence the resentment of the queen mother against the minister as well as that of anne of austria had free course and when the royal train took the road slowly back to paris in the month of october the ruin of the cardinal had been resolved upon what a trip was that descent of the loire from rouen to briard in the same boat and quote, at very close quarters between the queen mother and the cardinal says bassompierre she hoped that she would more easily be able to have her will and crush her servant with the more facility the less he was on his guard against it she looked at him with a kindly eye accepted his dutiful attentions and respects as usual and spoke to him with as much appearance of confidence as if she had wholly given it him End quote. 
Memorial de Richelieu, pages 303 to 305. The king had requested his mother, quote, to put off for six weeks or two months the grand move against the cardinal for the sake of the affairs of his kingdom, which were then at a crisis in Italy, end quote. Memoir de Bassompierre, page 276. And she had promised him. But Richelieu, quote, suspected something wrong and discovered more, end quote, and on the 12th of November, 1630, when mother and son were holding an early conference at the Luxembourg, a fine palace which Mary de Medici had just finished, quote, the cardinal arrived there. Finding the door of the chamber closed, he entered the gallery and went and knocked at the door of the cabinet, where he obtained no answer. Tired of waiting, and knowing the ins and outs of the mansion, he entered by the little chapel, whereat the king was somewhat dismayed, and said to the queen in despair, Here he is, thinking no doubt that he would blaze forth. The cardinal, who perceived this dismay, said to them, I am sure you were speaking about me. The queen answered, We were not. Whereupon he, having replied, Confess it, madame, she said yes, and thereupon conducted herself with great tartness towards him, declaring to the king that she would not put up with the cardinal any longer, or see in her house either him or any of his relatives and friends, to whom she incontinently gave their dismissal, and not to them only, but even down to the pettiest of her officers, who had come to her from his hands. End quote. Memoir de Richelieu, page 428. The struggle was begun. Already the courtiers were flocking to the Luxembourg. The keeper of the seals, Marillac, had gone away to sleep at his country house in Glatigny, quite close to Versailles, where the king was expected, and he was hoping that Louis the Thirteenth would summon him and put the power in his hands. The king was chatting with his favourite Saint-Simon, and tapping with his finger-tips on the window-pane. Quote, "'What do you think of all of this?' he asked. Quote, "'Sir,' was the reply, "'I seem to be in another world, but at any rate you are master.' Quote, Yes, I am, answered the king, and I will make it felt, too. End quote. He sent for Cardinal La Valette, son of the Duke of Epernon, but devoted to Richelieu. Quote, the cardinal has a good master, he said. Go and make my compliments to him, and tell him to come to me without delay. End quote. Memoir de Bassompierre, page 276. With all his temper and the hesitations born of his melancholy mind, Louis the Thirteenth could appreciate and discern the great interests of his kingdom and of his power. The queen had supposed that the king would abandon the cardinal, and, quote, that her private authority as mother, and the pious affection and honour the king showed her as her son, would prevail over the public care which he ought as king to take of his kingdom and his people. But God, who holds in his hand the hearts of princes, disposed things otherwise. His majesty resolved to defend his servant against the malice of those who prompted the queen to this wicked design. End quote. Memoir de Richelieu. He conversed a long while with the cardinal, and when the keeper of the seals awoke the next morning, it was to learn that the minister was at Versailles with the king, who had lodged him in a room under his own, that his majesty demanded the seals back, and that the exons were at his, Marillac's, door to secure his person. At the same time was dispatched a courier to headquarters at Folizzo in Piemont. The three marshals, Schomburg, La Force, and Marillac, had all formed a junction there. Marillac, brother of the keeper of the seals, held the command that day, and he was awaiting with patience the news, already announced by his brother, of the cardinal's disgrace. Marshal Schomburg opened the dispatches, and the first words that met his eye were these, written in the king's own hand, quote, my dear cousin, you will not fail to arrest Marshal Marillac. It is for the good of my service and for your own exculpation. End quote. The marshal was greatly embarrassed. A great part of the troops had come with Marillac from the army of Champagne and were devoted to him. Schomberg determined, on the advice of Marshal La Force, in full council of captains, to show Marillac the postscript. Quote, Sir, answered the marshal, a subject must not murmur against his master, nor say of him that the things he alleges are false. I can protest with truth that I have done nothing contrary to his service. The truth is that my brother the keeper of the seals and I have always been the servants of the queen mother. She must have had the worst of it, and Cardinal Richelieu has won the day against her and her servants. End quote. Memoir de Puissier. Thus arrested in the very midst of the army he commanded, Marshal Marillac was taken to the castle of saint Menou, and thence to Verdun, where a court of justice extraordinary sat upon his case. It was cleared of any political accusation. The marshal was prosecuted for speculation and extortion, common crimes at that time with many generals, and always odious to the nation, which regarded their punishment with favour. 
it is a very strange thing said Maliac, to prosecute me as they do my trial is a mere question of hay straw wood stones and lime there is not case enough for whipping a lackey End quote. there was case enough for sentencing to death a marshal of france the proceedings lasted eighteen months the commission was transferred from verdun to ruel to the very house of the cardinal Marillac was found guilty by a majority of one only the execution took place on the tenth of may sixteen thirty two the former keeper of the seals michael de Marillac, died of decline at chateau d'un three months after the death of his brother dupes day was over and lost the queen mother's attack on richelieu had failed before the minister's ascendancy and the king's calculating fidelity to a servant he did not like but mary de medici's anger was not calmed and the struggle remained set between her and the cardinal the duke of orleans who had lost his wife after a year's marriage had not hitherto joined his mother's party but all on a sudden excited by his grievances he arrived at the cardinal's on the thirtieth of january sixteen thirty one quote, with a strong escort and told him that he would consider it a strange purpose that had brought him there that so long as he supposed that the cardinal would serve him he had been quite willing to show him amity now when he saw that he foiled him in everything that he had promised to such an extent that the way in which he monsieur had behaved himself had served no end but to make the world believe that he had abandoned the queen his mother he had come to take back the word he had given him to show him affection on leaving the cardinal's house monsieur got into his carriage and went off in haste to orleans whilst the king having received notice from richelieu was arriving with all dispatch from versailles to assure his minister quote, of his protection well knowing that nobody could wish him ill save for the faithful services he rendered him end quote. memoire de richelieu page four forty four the queen mother had undoubtedly been aware of the duke of orleans project for she had given up to him madame's jewels which he had confided to her she nevertheless sent her equerry to the king protesting quote, that she had been much astonished when she heard of monsieur's departure that she had almost fainted on the spot and that monsieur had sent her word that he was going away from court because he could no longer tolerate the cardinal's violent proceedings against her Quote, when the king signified to her that he considered this withdrawal very strange and let her know that he had much trouble in believing that she knew nothing about it she took occasion to belch forth fire and flames against the cardinal and made a fresh attempt to ruin him in the king's estimation though she had previously bound herself by oath to take no more steps against him memoire de richelieu page four sixty five the cardinal either had not sworn at all or did not consider himself more bound than the queen by oaths their majesties set out for compiegne there the minister brought the affair before the council explaining with a skilful appearance of indifference the different courses to be taken and ending by propounding the question of his own retirement or the queen mother's Quote, his majesty without hesitation made his own choice taking the resolution of returning to paris and of begging the queen mother to retire for the time being to one of his mansions particularly recommending moulin which she had formerly expressed to the late king a wish to have and in order that she might be the better contented with it he offered her the government of it and of all the province next day february twenty three sixteen thirty one before the queen mother was up her royal son had taken the road back to paris leaving marshal d'estrees at compiegne to explain to the queen his departure and to hasten his mother's a task in which the marshal had but small success for mary de medici declared that if they meant to make her depart they would have to drag her stark naked from her bed she kept herself shut up in the castle refusing to go out and complaining of the injury the seclusion did to her health then she fled by night from compiegne attended by one gentleman only to go and take refuge in flanders whence she arrived before long at brussels the cardinal's game was definitely won mary de medici had lost all empire over her son whom she was never to see again the duke of orleans meanwhile had taken the road to lorraine seeking a refuge in the dominions of a prince able crafty restless and hostile to france from inclination as well as policy smitten before long with the duke's sister princess margaret gaston of orleans married her privately with a dispensation from the cardinal of lorraine all which did not prevent either duke or prince from barefacedly denying the marriage when the prince reproached them with having contracted this marriage without his consent in the month of june sixteen thirty two the duke of orleans entered france again at the head of some wretched regiments refuse of the spanish army given to him by don gonsalvo di Gordova for the first time he raised the standard of revolt openly 
for him it was of little consequence accustomed as he was to place himself at the head of parties that he abandoned without shame in the hour of danger but he dragged along with him in his error a man worthy of another fate and of another chief henry duke of montmorency marshal of france and governor of languedoc was a godson of henry the fourth who said one day to m de villeroy and to president Giannin, quote, look at my son montmorency how well made he is if ever the house of bourbon came to fail there is no family in europe which would so well deserve the crown of france as his whose great men have always supported it and even added to it at the price of their blood shining at court as well as in arms kind and charitable beloved of everybody and adored by his servants the duke of montmorency had steadily remained faithful to the king up to the fatal day when the duke of orleans entangled him in his hazardous enterprise languedoc was displeased with richelieu who had robbed it of some of its privileges the duke had no difficulty in collecting adherents there and he fancied himself to be already wielding the constable's sword five times borne by a montmorency when gaston of orleans entered france and languedoc sooner than he had been looked for and with a smaller following than he had promised the eighteen hundred men brought by the king's brother did not suffice to re-establish him with the queen his mother in the kingdom the governor of languedoc made an appeal to the estates then assembled at pezina he was supported by the bishop of albi and by that of nimes the province itself proclaimed revolt the sums demanded by the king were granted to the duke whom the deputies prayed to remain faithful to the interests of the province just as they promised never to abandon his the archbishop of narbonne alone opposed this rash act he left the estates where he was president and the duke marched out to meet monsieur as far as lunel Quote, troops were levied throughout the province and the environs as openly as if it had been for the king End quote but the regiments were slow in forming the duke of orleans wished to gain over some of the towns narbonne and montpellier closed their gates the bishop's influence had been counted upon for making sure of nimes and montmorency everywhere tried to practise on the huguenots quote, but the reformed ministers of nimes having had advices by letter from his majesty whereby he represented himself to have been advertised that the principal design of monsieur was to excite them of the religion styled reformed considered themselves bound in their own defence to do more than the rest for the king's service they assembled the consistory resolved to die in obedience to him went to seek the consuls and requested them to have the town council assembled in order that it might be brought to take a similar resolution which the consuls gained over by m de montmorency refused memoire de richelieu page one sixty thereupon the ministers sent off in haste to marshal la force who had already taken position at pont saint esprit with his army and he having dispatched some light horse on the twenty sixth of july the people cried hurrah for the king the bishop was obliged to fly and the town was kept to its allegiance quote, Beaucaire, the governor of which had been won over end quote, made armed resistance quote, if we beat the king's army said the duke of montmorency on returning to pezena after this incident we shall have no lack of towns if not we shall have to go and make our court at brussels end quote. at the news of his brother's revolt the king who happened to be on the frontiers of lorraine had put himself in motion but he marched at his ease and by short stages quote, thinking that the fire monsieur would kindle would be only a straw fire End quote. He hurried his movements when he heard of Montmorency's uprising, and left Paris after having put the seals upon the Duke's house, who had imprudently left five hundred and fifty thousand livres there. The money was seized and lodged in the royal safe. The Princess of Guemen, between whom and Montmorency there were very strong ties, went to see the cardinal, who was in attendance on the king. Quote, Sir, she said to him, you are going to Languedoc. Remember the great marks of attachment that M. de Montmorency showed you not long ago. You cannot forget then without ingratitude. End quote. Indeed, when the king believed himself to be dying at Lyon, he had recommended the cardinal to the Duke of Montmorency, who had promised to receive him into his government. Quote, Madame, replied Richelieu coldly, I have not been the first to break off. End quote already the parliament of toulouse remaining faithful to the king had annulled the resolutions of the estates the letters and the commissions of the governor and the parliament of paris had just enregistered a resolution against the servants and adherents of the duke of orleans as rebels guilty of high treason and disturbers of the common peace six weeks were granted the king's brother to put an end to all acts of hostility 
else the king was resolved to decree against him after that interval of delay quote, whatsoever he should consider it his duty to do for the preservation of his kingdom according to the laws of the realm and the example of his predecessors End quote. End of section twenty one Section twenty two of a popular history of France, volume five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume five, by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty eight Louis the thirteenth, Cardinal Richelieu and the court, sixteen twenty two to sixteen forty two, part three. It was against Marshal Schomberg that Montmorency was advancing the latter found himself isolated in his revolt shut up within the limits of his government between the two armies of the king who was marching in person against him calculations had been based upon an uprising of several provinces and the adhesion of several governors amongst others of the aged duke of epernon who had sent to monsieur to say quote, i am his very humble servant let him place himself in a position to be served End quote but no one moved the king every day received fresh protestations of fidelity and the duke of epernon had repaired to montauban to keep that restless city to its duty and to prevent any attempt from being made in the province at three leagues distance from castelnaudary marshal schomberg was besieging a castle called saint felix de carmain which held out for the duke of orleans montmorency advanced to the aid of the place he had two thousand foot and three thousand horse and the duke of orleans accompanied him with a large number of gentlemen the marshal had won over the defenders of saint felix and he was just half a league from castelnaudary when he encountered the rebel army the battle began almost at once count de moret natural son of henry the fourth and jacqueline de buil fired the first shot hearing the noise montmorency who commanded the right wing takes a squadron of cavalry and quote, urged on by that impetuosity which takes possession of all brave men at the like juncture he spurs his horse forward leaps the ditch which was across the road rides over the musketeers and the mishap of finding himself alone causing him to feel more indignation than fear he makes up his mind to signalize by his resistance a death which he cannot avoid end quote only a few gentlemen had followed him amongst others an old officer named count de rieux who had promised to die at his feet and he kept his word in vain had montmorency called to him his men-at-arms and the regiment of ventadour the rest of the cavalry did not budge count de moret had been killed terror was everywhere taking possession of the men the duke was engaged with the king's light horse he had just received two bullets in his mouth his horse quote, a small barb extremely swift end quote, came down with him and he fell wounded in seventeen places alone without a single squire to help him a sergeant of a company of the guards saw him fall and carried him into the road some soldiers who were present burst out crying they seemed to be lamenting their generals rather than their prisoners misfortune montmorency alone remained as if insensible to the blows of adversity and testified by the grandeur of his courage that quote, in him it had its seat in a place higher than the heart End quote. journal du duc de montmorency archive curieuse de l'histoire de france whilst the army of the duke of orleans was retiring carrying off their dead nearly all of the highest rank the king's men were bearing away montmorency mortally wounded to castelnaudary his wife mary felicia des ursins daughter of the duke of bracciano being ill in bed at beziers sent him a doctor together with her equerry to learn the truth about her husband's condition Quote, thou'lt tell my wife said the duke the number and greatness of the wounds thou hast seen and thou'lt assure her that it which i have caused her spirit is incomparably more painful to me than all the others End quote on passing through the faubourg of the town the duke desired that his litter should be opened quote, and the serenity that shone through the pallor of his visage moved the feelings of all present and forced tears from the stoutest and the most stolid End quote. journal du duc de montmorency archive curieuse de l'histoire de france the duke of orleans did not lack the courage of the soldier he would fain have rescued montmorency and sought to rally his forces but the troops of languedoc would obey none but the governor the foreigners mutinied and the king's brother had no longer an army quote, next day when it was too late says richelieu monsieur sent a trumpeter to demand battle of marshal schomberg who replied that he would not give it but that if he met him he would try to defend himself against him End quote. 
monsieur considered himself absolved from seeking the combat and henceforth busied himself about nothing but negotiation albi bezier and pezena hastened to give in their submission it was necessary for the duchess of montmorency ill and in despair to quicken her departure from bezier where she was no longer safe Quote, as she passed along the streets she heard nothing but a confusion of voices amongst the people speaking insolently of those who would withdraw in apprehension End quote. the king was already at lyons he was at pont saint esprit when he sent a message to his brother from whom he had already received emissaries on the road the first demands of gaston d'orleans were still proud he required the release of montmorency the rehabilitation of all those who had served his party and his mother's places of surety and money the king took no notice and a second envoy from the prince was put in prison meanwhile the superintendent of finance m de bouillon had reached him from the king and quote, found the mind of monsieur very penitent and well disposed but not that of all the rest for monsieur confessed that he had been ill-advised to behave as he did at the cardinal's house and afterwards leave the court acknowledging himself to be much obliged to the king for the clemency he had shown to him in his proclamation which had touched him to the heart and that he was bounden therefore to the cardinal whom he had always liked and esteemed and believed that he also on his side liked him memoire de richelieu page one ninety six the duchess of montmorency knew monsieur although she it was said had pressed her husband to join him and all ill as she was had been following him ever since the battle of castelnaudary in the fear lest he should forget her husband in the treaty she could not unfortunately enter Bézier, and it was there that the arrangements were concluded monsieur protested his repentance cursing in particular father chateloube confessor and confidant of the queen his mother quote, whom he wished the king would have hanged he had given pretty counsel to the queen causing her to leave the kingdom for all the great hopes he had led her to conceive she was reduced to relieve her weariness by praying to god memoire de richelieu page one ninety six as for monsieur he was ready to give up all intelligence with spain lorraine and the queen his mother quote, who could negotiate her business herself end quote. he bound himself to take no interest quote, in him or those who had connected themselves with him on these occasions for their own purposes and he would not complain should the king make them suffer what they had deserved end quote it is true that he added to these base concessions many entreaties in favour of m de montmorency but m de bouillon did not permit him to be under any delusion quote, it is for your highness to choose he said whether or not you prefer to cling to the interests of m de montmorency displease the king and lose his good graces End quote. the prince signed everything then he set out for tours which the king had assigned for his residence receiving on the way from town to town all the honours that would have been paid to his majesty himself m de montmorency remained in prison Quote, he awaited death with a resignation which is inconceivable says the author of his memoir never did man speak more boldly than he about it it seemed as if he were recounting another's perils when he described his own to his servants and his guards who were the only witnesses of such lofty manliness his sister the princess of conde had a memorial prepared for his defence put before him he read it carefully then he tore it up quote, having always determined he said not to chicaner or go pettifogging for or dispute his life quote, i ought by rights to answer before the parliament of paris only said he to the commission of the parliament of toulouse instructed to conduct his trial but i give up with all my heart this privilege and all others that might delay my sentence there was not long to wait for the decree on arriving at toulouse october twenty seven at noon the duke had asked for a confessor quote, father said he to the priest i pray you to put me this moment in the shortest and most certain path to heaven that you can having nothing more to hope or wish for but god all his family had hurried up but without being able to obtain the favour of seeing the king quote, his majesty had strengthened himself in the resolution he had taken from the first to make in the case of the said sieur de montmorency a just example for all the grandees of his kingdom in the future as the late king his father had done in the person of marshal de biron says richelieu in his memoir the princess of conde could not gain admittance to his majesty who lent no ear to the supplications of his oldest servants represented by the aged duke of epernon who accused himself by his own mouth of having but lately committed the same crime as the duke of montmorency Quote, 
you can retire duke was all that louis the thirteenth deigned to reply quote, i should not be a king if i had not the feelings of private persons said he to marshal chatillon who pointed out to him the downcast looks and swollen eyes of all his court it was the thirtieth of october early and the duke of montmorency was sleeping peacefully his confessor came and awoke him quote, surgit yamus or rise let us be going he said as he awoke and when his surgeon would have dressed his wounds quote, now is the time to heal all my wounds with a single one he said and he had himself dressed in the clothes of white linen he had ordered to be made at lecture for the day of execution when the last questions were put to him by the judges he answered by a complete confession and when the decree was made known to him quote, i thank you gentlemen said he to the commissioners and i beg you to tell all them of your body from me that i hold this decree of the king's justice for a decree of god's mercy he walked to the scaffold with the same tranquillity saluting right and left those whom he knew to take leave of them then having with difficulty placed himself upon the block so much did his wounds still cause him to suffer he said out loud quote, domine jesu Asipe spiritum meum or lord jesus receive my spirit End quote. as his head fell the people rushed forward to catch his blood and dip their handkerchiefs in it henry de montmorency was the last of the ducal branch of his house and was only thirty-seven it was a fine opportunity for monsieur to once more break his engagements shame and anxiety drove him equally he was universally reproached with montmorency's death and he was by no means easy on the subject of his marriage of which no mention had been made in the arrangements he quitted tours and withdrew to flanders writing to the king to complain of the duke's execution saying that the life of the latter had been the tacit condition of his agreement and that his promise being thus not binding he was about to seek a secure retreat out of the kingdom Quote, everybody knows in what plight you were brother and whether you could have done anything else replied the king Quote, what think you gentlemen was it that lost the duke of montmorency his head said cardinal zapata to Bautru and barreau envoys of france whom he met in the antechamber of the king of spain quote, his crimes replied Bautru. Quote, no said the cardinal but the clemency of his majesty's predecessors End quote. louis the thirteenth and cardinal richelieu have assuredly not merited that reproach in history so many and such terrible examples were at last to win the all-powerful minister some years of repose once only in sixteen thirty six a new plot on the part of monsieur and the count of soissons threatened not only his power but his life the king's headquarters were established at the castle of desmoins and the princes urged on by montresor and saint ibal had resolved to compass the cardinal's death the blow was to be struck at the exit from the council richelieu conducted the king back to the bottom of the staircase the two gentlemen were awaiting the signal but monsieur did not budge and retired without saying a word the count of soissons dared not go any further and the cardinal mounted quietly to his own rooms without dreaming of the extreme peril he had run richelieu was rather lofty than proud and too clear-sighted to mistake the king's feelings towards him never did he feel any confidence in his position and never did he depart from his jealous and sometimes petty watchfulness any influence foreign to his own disquieted him in proximity to a master whose affairs he governed altogether without ever having been able to get the mastery over his melancholy and singular mind women filled but a small space in the life of louis the thirteenth twice however in that interval of ten years which separated the plot of montmorency from that of saint mar did the minister believe himself to be threatened by feminine influence and twice he used artifice to win the monarch's heart and confidence from two young girls of his court louise de la fayette and marie d'autefort both were maids of honour to the queen mademoiselle d'autefort was fourteen years old when in sixteen thirty at lyon in the languors of convalescence the king first remarked her blooming and at the same time severe beauty and her air of nobility and modesty and it was not long before the whole court knew that he had remarked her for his first care at the sermon was to send the young maid of honour the velvet cushion on which he knelt for her to sit upon mademoiselle d'autefort declined it and remained seated like her companions on the ground but henceforth the courtier's eyes were riveted on her movements on the interminable conversations in which she was detained by the king on his jealousies his tiffs and his reconciliations after their quarrels the king would pass the greater part of the day in writing out what he had said to mademoiselle d'autefort and what she had replied to him 
at his death his desk was found full of these singular reports of the most innocent but almost most stormy and most troublesome love affair that ever was the king was especially jealous of mademoiselle d'autefort's passionate devotion to the queen her mistress anne of austria Quote, you love an ingrate he said and you will see how she will repay your services End quote. Richelieu had been unable to win Mademoiselle d'Autefort, and he did his best to embitter the tiff which separated her from the king in 1635. But Louis XIII had learned the charm of confidence and intimacy, and he turned to Louise de Lafayette, a charming girl of seventeen, who was as virtuous as Mademoiselle d'Autefort, but more gentle and tender than she, and who gave her heart in all guilelessness to that king so powerful, so aweary, and so melancholy at the very climax of his reign happily for richelieu he had a means more certain than even mademoiselle d'autefort's pride of separating her from louis the thirteenth mademoiselle de lafayette whilst quite a child had serious ideas of becoming a nun and scruples about being false to her vocation troubled her at court and even in those conversations in which she reproached herself with taking too much pleasure father coussin her confessor who was also the king's sought to quiet her conscience he hoped much from the influence she could exercise over the king, but Mademoiselle de Lafayette, feeling herself troubled and perplexed, was urgent. When the Jesuit reported to Louis XIII the state of his fair young friend's feelings, the king, with tears in his eyes, replied, quote, Though I am very sorry she is going away, nevertheless I have no desire to be an obstacle to her vocation. Only let her wait until I have left for the army. End quote she did not wait however their last interview took place at the queen's who had no liking for mademoiselle de lafayette and as the king's carriage went out of the courtyard the young girl leaning against the window turned to one of her companions and said quote, alas i shall never see him again End quote but she did see him again often for some time he went to see her in her convent and quote, remained so long glued to her grating says madame de motteville that cardinal richelieu falling a prey to fresh terrors recommenced his intrigues to tear him from her entirely and he succeeded end quote. the king's affection for mademoiselle d'autefort awoke again she had just rendered the queen an important service anne of austria was secretly corresponding with her two brothers king philip the fourth and the cardinal infante a correspondence which might well make the king and his minister uneasy since it was carried on through madame de chevreuse and there was war at the time with spain the queen employed for this intercourse a valet named laporte who was arrested and thrown into prison the chancellor removed to val de grace whither the queen frequently retired he questioned the nuns and rummaged anne of austria's cell she was in mortal anxiety not knowing what laporte might say or how to unloose his tongue so as to keep due pace with her own confessions to the king and the cardinal mademoiselle d'autefort disguised herself as a servant went straight to the bastille and got a letter delivered to laporte thanks to the agency of commander de jarre his friend then in prison the confessions of mistress and agent being thus set in accord the queen obtained her pardon but not without having to put up with reproaches and conditions of stern supervision madame de chevreuse took fright and went to seek refuge in spain the king's inclination towards mademoiselle d'autefort revived without her having an idea of turning it to profit on her own account Quote, she had so much loftiness of spirit that she could never have brought herself to ask anything for herself and her family and all that could be wrung from her was to accept what the king and queen were pleased to give her End quote. End of section twenty two Section twenty three of A Popular History of France, Volume five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume five, by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty eight Louis the thirteenth, Cardinal Richelieu and the Court, sixteen twenty two to sixteen forty two, part four. Richelieu had never forgotten Mademoiselle d'Autefort's airs. He feared her, and accused her to the king of being concerned in Monsieur's continual intrigues. Louis the Thirteenth's growing affection for young saint mars son of Marshal Defia, was beginning to occupy the gloomy monarch, and he the more easily sacrificed Mademoiselle d'Autefort. The cardinal merely asked him to send her away for a fortnight. She insisted upon hearing the order from the king's own mouth. Quote, the fortnight will last all the rest of my life, she said, and so I take leave of your majesty forever. 
she went accompanied by the regrets and tears of anne of austria and leaving the field open to the new favorite the king's quote unquote, rattle as the cardinal called him m de cinq mars was only nineteen when he was made master of the wardrobe and grand equerry of france brilliant and witty he amused the king and occupied the leisure which peace gave him the passion louis the thirteenth felt for his favorite was jealous and capricious he upbraided the young man for his flights to paris to see his friends in the elegant society of the marais and sometimes also mary de gonzaga daughter of the duke of mantua wooed but lately by the duke of orleans and not indifferent it was said to the vows of m le grand as cinq mars was called the complaints were detailed to richelieu by the king himself in a strange correspondence which reminds one of the quote unquote, reports of his quarrels with mademoiselle d'autefort i am very sorry wrote louis the thirteenth on the fourth of january sixteen forty one to trouble you about the ill tempers of m le grand i upbraided him with his heedlessness he answered that for that matter he could not change and that he should do no better than he had done i said that considering his obligations to me he ought not to address me in that manner he answered in his usual way that he didn't want my kindness that he could do very well without it and that he would be quite as well content to be cinq mars as m le grand but as for changing his ways and his life p couldn't do it and so he continually nagging at me and i at him we came as far as the courtyard when i said to him that being in the temper he was in he would do me the pleasure of not coming to see me i have not seen him since signed louis end quote. this time the cardinal reconciled the king and the favorite whom he had himself placed near him but whose constant attendance upon the king his master he was beginning to find sometimes very troublesome quote, one day he sent word to him not to be for the future so continually at his heels and treated him even to his face with so much tartness and imperiousness as if he had been the lowest of his valets end quote. Saint Mars began to lend an ear to those who were egging him on against the cardinal. Then began a series of negotiations and intrigues. The Duke of Orleans had come back to Paris. The king was ill, and the cardinal more so than he. Thence arose conjectures and insensate hopes. The Duke of Bouillon, being sent for by the king, who confided to him the command of the army of Italy, was at the same time drawn into the plot which was beginning to be woven against the minister the duke of orleans and the queen were in it and the town of sedan of which bouillon was prince sovereign was wanted to serve the authors of the conspiracy as an asylum in case of reverse sedan alone was not sufficient there was need of an army whence was it to come thoughts naturally turned towards spain for so perilous a treaty a negotiator was required and the grand equerry proposed his friend viscount de fontrailles a man of wit who detested the cardinal and who would have considered it a simpler plan to assassinate him he consented however to take charge of the negotiation and he set out for madrid where his treaty was soon concluded in the name of the duke of orleans the spaniards were to furnish twelve thousand foot and five thousand horse four hundred thousand crowns down twelve thousand crowns pay a month and three hundred thousand livres to fortify the frontier town which was promised by the duke sedan cinq mars and the duke of bouillon were only mentioned in a separate instrument the king was then at narbonne on his way to his army which was besieging parpignan the grand equerry was with him fontrailles went to call upon him quote, i do not intend to be seen by anybody said he but to make speedily for england as i do not think i am strong enough to undergo the torture the cardinal might put me to in his own room on the least suspicion End quote. on the twenty first of april the cardinal was dangerously ill and the king left him at narbonne a prey to violent fever with an abscess on the arm which prevented him from writing whilst cinq mars ever present and ever at work was doing his best to insinuate into his master's mind suspicion of the minister and the hopes founded upon his disgrace or death the king listened as he subsequently avowed in order to discover his favourite's wicked thoughts and make him tell all he had in his heart Quote, the king was tacitly the head of this conspiracy says madame de motteville the grand equerry was the soul of it the name made use of was that of the duke of orleans the king's only brother and their counsel was the duke of bouillon who joined with them because having belonged to the party of m de soissons he was in very ill odour at court they all formed fine projects touching the change that was to take place to the advantage of their aggrandizement and fortunes persuading themselves that the cardinal could not live above a few days during which he would not be able to set himself right with the king End quote. 
such were their projects and their hopes when the gazette de france on the twenty first of june sixteen forty two gave these two pieces of news both together quote, the cardinal duke after remaining two days at arles embarked on the eleventh of this month for tarascon his health becoming better and better the king has ordered under arrest marquis de saint mars grand equerry of france end quote. great was the surprise and still greater was the dismay amongst the friends of saint mars quote, your grand designs are as well known at paris as that the seine flows under the pont neuf wrote mary de gonzaga to him a few days previously those grand designs so imprudently divulged caused a presentiment of great peril when left alone with his young favorite and suddenly overwhelmed amidst his army with cares and business of which his minister usually relieved him the king had too much wit not to perceive the frivolous insignificance of saint mars compared with the mighty capability of the cardinal Quote, i love you more than ever he wrote to richelieu we have been too long together to be ever separated as i wish everybody to understand End quote. In reply, the cardinal had sent him a copy of the treaty between saint mars and Spain. The king could not believe his eyes, and his wrath equalled his astonishment. Together with that of the grand equerry, he ordered the immediate arrest of M. de Thou, his intimate friend, and the order went out to secure the Duke of Bouillon, then at the head of the army of Italy. He, caught, like Marshal Marillac, in the midst of his troops, had vainly attempted to conceal himself, but he was taken and conducted to the castle of Pignerol. Fontrailles had seen the blow coming. He went to visit the Grand Equerry, and, quote, Sir, said he, you are a fine figure. If you were shorter by the whole head, you would not cease to be very tall. As for me, who am already very short, nothing could be taken off me without inconveniencing me, and making me cut the poorest figure in the world. You will be good enough, if you please, to let me get out of the way of edged tools. End quote. And he set out for Spain, whence he had hardly returned what had become of the most guilty if not the most dangerous of all the accomplices monsieur quote, the king's only or unique brother as madame de motteville calls him had come as far as moulin and had sent to ask the grand equerry to appoint a place of meeting when he heard of his accomplice's arrest and before long that of the duke of bouillon frightened to death as he was he saw that treachery was safer than flight and just as the king had joined the all but dying cardinal at tarascon there arrived an emissary from the duke of orleans bringing letters from him he assured the king of his fidelity he entreated chavigny the minister's confidant to give him quote, means of seeing his eminence before he saw the king in which case all would go well end quote. He appealed to the cardinal's generosity, begging him to keep his letter as an eternal reproach, if he were not thenceforth the most faithful and devoted of his friends. Abbé de la Rivière, who was charged to implore pardon for his master, was worthy of such a commission. He confessed everything, he signed everything, though he, quote, all but died of terror, end quote, and at the cardinal's demand he soon brought all those pontrooneries written out in the Duke of Orléans' own hand. The prince was all but obliged to appear at the trial, and deliver up his accomplices in the face of the whole world the respect however of chancellor siguier for his rank spared him this crowning disgrace the king's orders to his brother after being submitted to the cardinal bore this note in the minister's hand quote, monsieur will have in his place of exile twelve thousand crowns a month the same sum that the king of spain had promised to give him End quote. Quote, paralysis of the arm did not prevent the head from acting the dying cardinal had dictated to the king stretched on a couch at his side in a chamber of his house at montfrain near tarascon those last commands which completed the dishonour of the duke of orleans and the ruin of the favourite louis the thirteenth slowly took the road back to fontainebleau in the cardinal's litter which the latter had lent him the prisoners were left in the minister's keeping who ordered them before long to lyons whither he was himself removed the grand equerry coming from montpellier m de thou from tarascon in a boat towed by that of the cardinal and the duke of bouillon from pignerol were all three lodged in the castle of pierre Ancise. their examination was put off until the arrival of such magistrates quote, as should be capable of philosophizing and perpetually thinking of the means they must use for arriving at their ends end quote that was useless inasmuch as the grand equerry quote, never ceased to say quite openly that he had done nothing to which the king had not consented end quote. 
Louis the Thirteenth was no doubt affected by such language, for scarcely had he arrived at Fontainebleau, whither he had been preceded by news of the end of the Queen his mother, who had died at Cologne in exile and poverty, when he wrote to all the parliaments of his kingdom, to the governors of the provinces, and to the ambassadors at foreign courts, to give his own account of the arrest of the guilty, and the part he himself had played in the matter. Quote, the notable and visible change which for the last year appeared in the conduct of Sieur de Saint Mars, our grand equerry, made us resolve, as soon as we perceived it, to carefully keep watch on his actions and his words, in order to fathom them and discover what could be the cause. To this end, we resolved to let him act and speak with us more freely than heretofore. End quote. And in a letter written straight to the Chancellor, the King exclaims in wrath. Quote, it is true that having seen me sometimes dissatisfied with the cardinal whether from the apprehension i felt lest he should hinder me from going to the siege of perpignan or to induce me to leave it for fear lest my health might suffer or from any other like reason the said sieur de saint mars left nothing undone to chafe me against my said cousin which i put up with so long as his evil offices were confined within the bounds of moderation but when he went so far as to suggest to me that the cardinal must be got rid of, and offered to carry it out himself, I conceived a horror of his evil thoughts, and held them in detestation. Although I have only to say so for you to believe it, there is nobody who can deem but that it must have been so, for otherwise what motive would he have had for joining himself to Spain against me, if I had approved of what he desired? End quote the trial was a foregone conclusion the king and his brother made common cause in order to overwhelm the accused quote, an earnest of a peace which was not such as god announced with good will to man on christmas day writes madame de Madeville, but such as may exist at court and amongst brothers of royal blood End quote. the cardinal did not think it necessary to wait for the sentence he had arrived at his house at lyons in a sort of square chamber covered with red damask and borne on the shoulders of eighteen guards there stretched upon his couch a table covered with papers beside him he worked and chatted with whomsoever of his servants he had been pleased to have as his companion on the road it was in the same equipage that he left lyon to gain the loire and return to paris on his passage it was necessary to pull down lumps of wall and throw bridges over the fosses to make way for this vast litter and the indomitable man that lay dying within it it was on the twelfth of september sixteen forty two that the accused appeared before the commission. There were now but two of them. The Duke of Bouillon had made his private arrangement with the cardinal, confessing everything, and requesting, quote, to have his life spared in order that he might employ it to preserve to the Catholic Church five little children whom his death would leave to persons of the opposite religion, end quote. In consideration of this pardon, a demand was made upon him to give up Sedan to the king, quote, though it were easy to gain possession of it by investment, end quote. The duke consented to all, and he awaited in his dungeon at pierre Ancy's the execution of his accomplices, who had no town to surrender. Their death was to be the signal of his liberation. The two accused denied nothing. M. de Thou merely maintained that he had not been in any way mixed up with a conspiracy, proving that he had blamed the treaty with Spain, and that his only crime was not having revealed it. Quote, he believed me to be his friend, his one faithful friend, said he, speaking of saint mars and I had no mind to betray him. End quote. The Grand Equerry told in detail the story of the plot, his connection with the Duke of Orleans, who had missed no opportunity of paying court to him, the resolutions taken in concert with the Duke of Bouillon, and the treaty concluded with Spain, quote, confessing that he had erred, and had no hope but in the clemency of the King, and of the Cardinal, whose generosity would be so much the more shown in asking pardon for him, as he was the less bound to do so. End quote there was not long to wait for the decree the votes were unanimous against the grand equerry a single one of the judges pronouncing in favour of m de thou the latter turned towards saint mars and said quote, ah well sir humanly speaking i might complain of you you have placed me in the dock and you are the cause of my death but god knows how i love you let us die sir let us die courageously and win paradise End quote the decree against saint mars sentenced him to undergo the question in order to get a more complete revelation of his accomplices quote, it had been resolved not to put him to it says talemon desraux but it was exhibited to him nevertheless it gave him a turn but it did not make him do anything to belie himself and he was just taking off his doublet when he was told to raise his hand in sign of telling the truth End quote. The execution was not destined to be long deferred. The very day on which the sentence was delivered saw the execution of it. 
Quote, the grand equerry showed a never-changing and very resolute firmness to the death, together with admirable calmness and the constancy and devoutness of a Christian, wrote M. du Marcat, councillor of state, to the secretary of state Brionne, and Talemont d'Hérault adds, quote, he died with astoundingly great courage, and did not waste time in speechifying. He would not have his eyes bandaged, and kept them open when the blow was struck, end quote. M. de Thou said not a word save to God, repeating the credo even to the very scaffold, with a fervour of devotion that touched all present. Quote, we have seen, says a report at the time, the favourite of the greatest and most just of kings lose his head upon the scaffold at the age of twenty-two, but with a firmness which has scarcely its parallel in our histories. We have seen a councillor of state die like a saint after a crime which men cannot justly pardon there is nobody in the world who knowing of their conspiracy against the state does not think them worthy of death and there will be few who having knowledge of their rank and their fine natural qualities will not mourn their sad fate End quote. Quote, now that i make not a single step which does not lead me to death i am more capable than anybody else of estimating the value of the things of the world wrote saint mars to his mother the wife of marshal de fia quote, enough of this world away to paradise said m de thou as he marched to the scaffold chalet and montmorency had used the same language at the last hour and at the bottom of their hearts the frivolous courtier and the hare-brained conspirator as well as the great soldier and the grave magistrate had recovered their faith in god end of section twenty three end of chapter thirty eight Section 24 of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 39. Louis XIII, Cardinal Richelieu and the Provinces, Part 1. The story has been told of the conspiracies at court and the repeated checks suffered by the great lords in their attempts against Cardinal Richelieu with the exception of languedoc under the influence of its governor the duke of montmorency the provinces took no part in these enterprises their opposition was of another sort and it is amongst the parliaments chiefly that we must look for it Quote, the king's cabinet and his bedtime business or petit coucher cause me more embarrassment than the whole of europe causes me said the cardinal in the days of the great storms at court he would often have had less trouble in managing the parliaments and the parliament of paris in particular if the latter had not felt itself supported by a party at court for a long time past a pretension had been put forward by that great body to give the king advice and to replace towards him the vanished states-general we hold the place in council of the princes and barons who from time immemorial were near the person of the kings End quote, was the language used in 1615 in the representations of the Parliament, which had dared, without royal order, to summon the princes, dukes, peers, and officers of the crown to deliberate upon what was to be done for the service of the king, the good of the state, and the relief of the people. This pretension on the part of the Parliaments was what Cardinal Richelieu was continually fighting against. He would not allow the intervention of the magistrates in the government of the state when he took the power into his hands nine parliaments sat in france paris toulouse grenoble bordeaux dijon rouen Esch, rennes and pau he created but one that of metz in sixteen thirty three to sever in a definitive manner the bonds which still attached the three bishoprics to the germanic empire trials at that time were carried in the last resort to spire throughout the history of france we find the parliament of paris bolder and more enterprising than all the rest and it did not belie its character in the very teeth of richelieu when after dupes day was over louis the thirteenth declared all the companions of his brother's escape guilty of high treason the parliament of dijon to which the decree was presented by the king himself enregistered it without making any difficulty all the other parliaments followed the example that of paris alone resisted and its decision on the twenty fifth of april contained a bitter censure upon the cardinal's administration on the twelfth of may the decision of that parliament was quashed by a decree of the royal council and all its members were summoned to the louvre on their knees they had to hear the severe reprimand delivered by chateauneuf keeper of the seals and one president and three councillors were at the same time dismissed when the parliament still indomitable would have had those magistrates sit in defiance of the royal order they were not to be found in their houses the soldiery had carried them off 
the trial of marshal marillac before a commission twice modified during the course of proceedings of the parliament of dijon was the occasion of a fresh reclamation on the part of the parliament of paris and the king's ill-humour against the magistrates burst forth on the occasion of a commission constituted at the arsenal to take cognizance of the crime of coining the parliament made some formal objections the king who was at that time at metz with his troops summoned president seguier and several councillors he quashed the decree of the parliament quote, you are only constituted said he to judge between master peter and master john or between john doe and richard roe if you go on as at present i will pare your nails so close that you'll be sorry for it End quote. five councillors were interdicted and had great trouble in obtaining authority to sit again so many and such frequent squabbles whether about points of jurisdiction or about the registration of edicts respecting finances which the parliament claimed to have the right of looking into caused between the king inspired by his minister and the parliament of paris an irritation which reached its height during the trial of the duke of la valette third son of the duke of epernon accused not without grounds of having caused the failure of the siege of fontarabia from jealousy towards the prince of conde the affair was called on before a commission composed of dukes and peers some councillors of state and some members of the parliament which demanded that the duke should be removed to its jurisdiction Quote, i will not have it answered the king you are always making difficulties it seems as if you wanted to keep me in leading strings but i am master and shall know how to make myself obeyed it is a gross error to suppose that i have not a right to bring to judgment whom i think proper and where i please End quote. the king himself asked the judges for their opinion Isambert, recueil des anciennes lois françaises. Quote, Sir, replied Councillor Pinon, dean of the Grand Chamber, for fifty years I have been in the Parliament, and I never saw anything of this sort. Monsieur de la Valette had the honour of wedding a natural sister of your Majesty, and he is besides a peer of France. I implore you to remove him to the jurisdiction of the Parliament. End quote. Quote, your opinion, said the King curtly. Quote, I am of opinion that the Duke of La Valette be removed to be tried before the Parliament. End quote. Quote, I will not have that. It is no opinion. End quote. Quote, Sir, removal is a legitimate opinion. End quote. Quote, Your opinion on the case, rejoined the king, who was beginning to be angry. If not, I know what I must do. End quote. President Bellievre was even bolder. Quote, it is a strange thing said he to louis the thirteenth's face to see a king giving his vote at the criminal trial of one of his subjects hitherto kings have reserved to themselves the rights of grace and have removed to their officers province the sentencing of culprits could your majesty bear to see in the dock a nobleman who might leave your presence only for the scaffold it is incompatible with kingly majesty quote. Quote, your opinion on the case bade the king quote, Sir, I have no other opinion. End quote. The Duke of La Valette had taken refuge in England. He was condemned and executed in effigy. The Attorney General, Matthew Mould, quote, did not consider it his business to carry out an execution of that sort, quote, and recourse was obliged to be had to the Lieutenant Governor of Convicts at the Chatelet of Paris. End quote. The cup had overflowed, and the Cardinal resolved to put an end to an opposition which was the more irritating inasmuch as it was sometimes legitimate a notification of the king's published in sixteen forty one prohibited the parliament from any interference in affairs of state and administration the whole of richelieu's home policy is summed up in the preamble to that instrument a formal declaration of absolute power concentrated in the hands of the king Quote, it seemeth that the institution of monarchies having its foundation in the government of a single one that rank is as it were the soul which animates them and inspires them with as much force and vigour as they can have short of perfection but as this absolute authority raises states to the highest pinnacle of their glory so when it happens to be enfeebled they are observed in a short time to fall from their high estate there is no need to go out of france to find instances of truth the fatal disorders and divisions of the league which ought to be buried in eternal oblivion owed their origin and growth to disregard of kingly authority henry the great in whom god had put the most excellent virtues of a great prince on succeeding to the crown of henry the third restored by his valour the kingly authority which had been as it were cast down and trampled under foot france recovered her pristine vigour and let all europe see that power concentrated in the person of the sovereign is the source of the glory and greatness of monarchies and the foundation upon which their preservation rests 
we then have thought it necessary to regulate the administration of justice and to make known to our parliaments what is the legitimate usage of the authority which the kings our predecessors and we have deposited with them in order that a thing which was established for the good of the people may not produce contrary effects as would happen if the officers instead of contenting themselves with that power which makes them judges in matters of life and death and touching the fortunes of our subjects would fain meddle in the government of the state which appertains to the prince only the cardinal had gained the victory parliament bowed the head its attempts at independence during the fronde were but a flash and the yoke of louis the fourteenth became the more heavy for it the pretensions of the magistrates were often foundationless the restless and meddlesome character of their assemblies did harm to their remonstrances but for a long while they maintained in the teeth of more and more absolute kingly power the country's rights in the government and they had perceived the dangers of that sovereign monarchy which certainly sometimes raises states to the highest pinnacle of their glory but only to let them sink before long to a condition of the most grievous abasement though always first in the breach the parliament of paris was not alone in its opposition to the cardinal the parliament of dijon protested against the sentence of marshal marillac and refused to its shame to bear its share of the expenses for the defence of burgundy against the duke of lorraine in sixteen thirty six a refusal which cost it the suspension of its premier president the parliament of brittany in defence of its jurisdictional privileges refused to enregister the decree which had for object the foundation of a company trading with the indies quote, for the general trade between the west and the east end quote, a grand idea of richelieu's the seat of which was to be in the roads of morbihan the company already formed was disheartened thanks to the delays caused by the parliament and the enterprise failed the parliament of grenoble fearing a dearth of corn in dauphiny quashed the treaties of supply for the army of italy at the time of the second expedition to mantua it went so far as to have the dealers granaries thrown open and the superintendent of finance Demery, was obliged to come to terms with the deputies of dauphiny quote, in order that they of the parliament of grenoble who said they had no interests but those of the province might have no reason to prevent for the future the transport of corn says richelieu himself in his memoir the parliament of rouen had always passed for one of the most recalcitrant the province of normandy was rich and consequently overwhelmed with imposts and several times the parliament refused to enregister financial edicts which still further aggravated the distress of the people in sixteen thirty seven the king threatened to go in person to rouen and bring the parliament to submission whereat it took fright and enregistered decrees for twenty-two millions it was no doubt this augmentation of imposts that brought about the revolt of the nu pieds or barefoots in sixteen thirty nine before now in sixteen twenty four and in sixteen thirty seven in perigord and rouergues two popular risings of the same sort under the name of croquins or paupers had disquieted the authorities and the governor of the province had found some trouble in putting them down the nu pieds were more numerous and more violent still from Rouen to Avranche all the country was ablaze. At Coutances and at Vire, several monopoliers and gabelards, as the fiscal officers were called, were massacred. A great number of houses were burned, and most of the receiving offices were pulled down or pillaged. Everywhere the army of suffering, or armée de souffrance, the name given by the revolters to themselves, made appeal to violent passions. Popular rhymes were circulated from hand to hand in the name of General Nupier, or Barefoot, an imaginary personage whom nobody ever saw. Some of these verses are fair enough. Quote, Dear land of mine, thou canst no more. What boots it to have served so well? For see, thy faithful service bore this bitter fruit, the cursed Gabelle. Is that the guerdon earned by those who succoured France against her foes, who saved her kings, upheld her crown, and raised the lilies trodden down, in spite of all the foe could do, in spite of Spain and England too? Recall thy generous blood, and show that all posterity may know. Duke William's breed still lives at need. Show that thou hast a heavier hand than erst came forth from northern land a hand so strong a heart so high these tyrants all shall beaten cry from normans and the norman race deliver us o god of grace End quote. 
the tumult was more violent at rouen than anywhere else and the parliament energetically resisted the mob it had sent two councillors as a deputation to paris to inform the king about the state of affairs Quote, you may signify to the gentlemen of the parliament of rouen said chancellor Siguier, in answer to the delegates that i thank them for the trouble they have taken on this occasion i will let the king know how they have behaved in this affair i beg them to go on as they have begun i know that the parliament did very good service there in fact several councillors on foot in the street and in the very midst of the revolters had at the peril of their lives defended le tellier de tourneville receiver-general of gables and his officers whilst the whole parliament in their robes with the premier president at their head perambulated rouen amidst the angry mob repairing at once to the points most threatened insomuch that the presidents and councillors were quote, in great danger and fear for their skins end quote. Histoire du Parlement de Normandie by M. Floquet. It was this terror, born of tumults and the sight of an infuriated populace, which at a later period retarded the Parliament in dealing out justice, and brought down upon it the wrath of the King and of the Cardinal. Meanwhile the insurrection was gaining ground, and the local authorities were powerless to repress it. There was hesitation at the King's Council in choosing between Marshal Rantzau and M. de Gassion to command the forces ordered to march into Normandy. Quote, that country yields no wine, said the king, that will not do for Rantzau, or be good quarters for him. End quote. And they sent Colonel Gassion, not so heavy a drinker as Rantzau, a good soldier and an inflexible character. First at Cayenne, then at Avranches, where there was fighting to be done, at Coutances and at Elbeuf, Gassion's soldiery everywhere left the country behind them in subjection, in ruin, and in despair. They entered Rouen on the 31st of December, 1639, and on the 2nd of January, 1640, the Chancellor himself arrived to do justice on the rebels heaped up in the prisons, whom the Parliament dared not bring up for judgment. Quote, I come to Rouen, he said, on entering the town, not to deliberate, but to declare and execute the matters on which my mind is made up. End quote. And he forbade all intervention on the part of the archbishop, Francis de Harlay, who was disposed, in accordance with his office of love, as well as the parliamentary name he bore, to implore pity for the culprits, and to excuse the backward judges. The chancellor did not give himself the trouble to draw up sentences. Quote, the decree is at the tip of my staff replied picot captain of his guards when he was asked to show his orders the executions were numerous in higher and lower normandy and the parliament received the wages of its tardiness all the members of the body even the most aged and infirm were obliged to leave rouen a commission of fifteen councillors of the parliament of paris came to replace provisionally the interdicted parliament of normandy and when the magistrates were empowered at last to resume their sitting it was only a six months term that is the parliament henceforth found itself divided into two fragments perfect strangers one to the other which were to sit alternately for six months Quote, a veritable thunderbolt for that sovereign court for by the six months term says m floquet there was no longer any parliament properly speaking but two phantoms of parliaments making war on each other whilst the government had the field open to carve and cut without control End quote. Quote, all obedience is now from fear, wrote Grotius to Oschenstiern, Chancellor of Sweden. The idea is to exorcise and annihilate hatred by means of terror. Quote. Quote, this year, wrote an inhabitant of Rouen, there have been no New Year's presents, or étrennes, no singing of the king's drinking song, or le roi boite, in any house. Little children will be able to tell tales of it when they have attained to man's estate for never these fifty years past so far as i can learn has it been so End quote. journal de l'abbé de la rue the heaviest imposts weighed upon the whole province which thus expiated the crime of an insignificant portion of its inhabitants quote, the king shall not lose the value of this handkerchief that i hold said the superintendent bouillon on arriving at rouen and he kept his word rouen alone had to pay more than three millions the province and its parliaments were henceforth reduced to submission End of section 24. Section 25 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 39. Louis Thirteenth, Cardinal Richelieu and the Provinces, Part 2. 
it was not only the parliaments that resisted the efforts of cardinal richelieu to concentrate all the power of the government in the hands of the king from the time that the sovereigns had given up convoking the states-general the states provincial had alone preserved the right of bringing to the foot of the throne the plaints and petitions of subjects unhappily few provinces enjoyed this privilege languedoc brittany burgundy provence dauphiny and the countship of pau alone were states districts that is to say allowed to tax themselves independently and govern themselves to a certain extent normandy though an elections district and as such subject to the royal agents in respect of finance had states which continued to meet even in sixteen sixty six the states provincial were always convoked by the king who fixed the place and duration of assembly the composition of the states provincial varied a great deal according to the districts in brittany all noblemen settled in the province had the right of sitting whilst the third estate were represented by only forty deputies in languedoc on the contrary the nobility had but twenty-three representatives and the class of the third estate numbered sixty-eight deputies hence no doubt the divergences of conduct to be remarked in those two provinces between the parliament and the states provincial in languedoc even during montmorency's insurrection the parliament remained faithful to the king and submissive to the cardinal whilst the states declared in favour of the revolt in brittany the parliament thwarted richelieu's efforts in favour of trade which had been enthusiastically welcomed by the states in languedoc as well as in dauphiny the cardinal's energy was constantly directed towards reducing the privileges which put the imposts and consequently the royal revenues at the discretion of the states montmorency's insurrection cost languedoc a great portion of its liberties which had already been jeopardied in sixteen twenty nine on the occasion of the huguenots rising and those of dauphiny were completely lost the states were suppressed in sixteen twenty eight the states of burgundy ordinarily assembled every three years but they were accustomed on separating to appoint quote, a chamber of states general end quote, whereat the nobility clergy and third estate were represented and which was charged to watch over the interests of the province in the interval between the sessions when in sixteen twenty nine richelieu proposed to create as in languedoc a body of quote unquote, elect to arrange with the fiscal agents for the rating of imposts without the concurrence of the states the assembly proclaimed that quote, it was all over with the liberties of the province if the edict passed end quote. and in the chamber of the nobility two gentlemen were observed to draw their swords but spite of the disturbance which took place at dijon in sixteen thirty on occasion of an impost on wines and which was called from the title of a popular ditty la sedition de l'enturlu the province preserved its liberties and remained a state's district it was the same subject that excited in provence the revolt of the cascavieux or bell-bearers whenever there was any question of elections or quote unquote, elect the conspirators sounded their bells as a rallying signal and so numerous was the body of adherents that the bells were heard tinkling everywhere the prince of conde was obliged to march against the revolters and the states assembled at tarascon found themselves forced to vote a subsidy of one million five hundred thousand livres at this cost the privileges of provence were respected the states of brittany on the contrary lent the cardinal faithful support when he repaired thither with the king in sixteen twenty six at the time of the conspiracy of chalais the duke of vendome governor of brittany had just been arrested the states requested the king quote, never to give them a governor issue of the old dukes and to destroy the fortifications of the towns and castles which were of no use for the defence of the country end quote. the petty noblemen a majority in the states thus delivered over the province to the kingly power from jealousy of the great lords the ordinance dated from nantes on the thirty first of july sixteen twenty six rendered the measure general throughout france the battlements of the castles fell beneath the axe of the demolishers and the masses of the district welcomed enthusiastically the downfall of those old reminiscences of feudal oppression as a sequel to the systematic humiliation of the great lords even when provincial governors and to the gradual enfeeblement of provincial institutions richelieu had to create in all parts of france still so diverse in organization as well as in manners representatives of the kingly power of too modest and feeble a type to do without him but capable of applying his measures and making his wishes respected before now the kings of france had several times over perceived the necessity of keeping up a supervision over the conduct of their officers in the provinces the inquisitors or enquesteurs of st louis the ridings of the revising masters or chevauchés des maîtres de requête 
the departmental commissioners or commissaires des parties were so many temporary and travelling inspectors whose duty it was to inform the king of the state of affairs throughout the kingdom richelieu substituted for these shifting commissions a fixed and regular institution and in sixteen thirty seven he established in all the provinces overseers of justice police and finance who were chosen for the most part from amongst the burgesses and who before long concentrated in their hands the whole administration and maintained the struggle of the kingly power against the governors the sovereign courts and the states provincial at the time when the overseers of provinces were instituted the battle of pure monarchy was gained richelieu had no further need of allies he wanted mere subjects but at the beginning of his ministry he had felt the need of throwing himself sometimes for support on the nation and this great foe of the states-general had twice convoked the assembly of notables the first took place at fontainebleau in sixteen twenty five twenty six the cardinal was at that time at loggerheads with the court of rome Quote, if the most christian king said he is bound to watch over the interests of the catholic church he has first of all to maintain his own reputation in the world what use would it be for a state to have power riches and popular government if it had not character enough to bring other people to form alliance with it these few words summed up the great minister's foreign policy to protect the catholic church whilst keeping up protestant alliances the notables understood the wisdom of this conduct and richelieu received their adhesion it was just the same the following year the day after the conspiracy of chalet the cardinal convoked the assembly of notables quote, we do protest before the living god said the letters of convocation that we have no other aim and intention but his honour and the welfare of our subjects that is why we do conjure in his name those whom we convoke and do most expressly command them without fear or desire of displeasing or pleasing any to give us in all frankness and sincerity the counsels they shall judge on their consciences to be the most salutary and convenient for the welfare of the commonwealth the assembly so solemnly convoked opened its sittings at the palace of the tuileries on the second of december sixteen twenty six the state of the finances was what chiefly occupied those present and the cardinal himself pointed out the general principles of the reform he calculated upon establishing quote, it is impossible said he to meddle with the expenses necessary for the preservation of the state it were a crime to think of such a thing the retrenchment therefore must be in the case of useless expenses the most stringent rules are and appear to be even to the most ill-regulated minds comparatively mild when they have indeed as well as in appearance no object but the public good and the safety of the state to restore the state to its pristine splendour we need not many ordinances but a great deal of practical performance the performance appertained to richelieu and he readily dispensed with many ordinances the assembly was favourable to his measures but amongst those that it rejected was the proposal to substitute loss of offices and confiscation for the penalty of death in matters of rebellion and conspiracy Quote, better a moderate but certain penalty said the cardinal than a punishment too severe to be always inflicted it was the notables who preserved in the hands of the inflexible minister the terrible weapon of which he availed himself so often the assembly separated on the twenty fourth of february sixteen twenty seven the last that was convoked before the revolution of seventeen eighty nine it was in answer to its demands as well as to those of the states of sixteen fourteen that the keeper of the seals michael marillac drew up in sixteen twenty nine the important administrative ordinance that has preserved from its author's name the title of code michaud the cardinal had propounded to the notables a question which he had greatly at heart the foundation of a navy already when disposing some weeks previously of the government of brittany which had been taken away from the duke of vendome he had separated from the office that of admiral of brittany already he was in a position to purchase from m de montmorency his office of grand admiral of france so as to suppress it and substitute for it that of grand master of navigation which was personally conferred upon richelieu by an edict and registered on the eighteenth of march sixteen twenty seven Quote, of the power which it has seemed agreeable to his majesty that i should hold he wrote on the twentieth of january sixteen twenty seven i can say with truth that it is so moderate that it could not be more so to be an appreciable service seeing that i have desired no wage or salary so as not to be a charge to the state and i can add without vanity that the proposal to take no wage came from me and that his majesty made a difficulty about letting it be so End quote. 
the notables had thanked the king for the intention he had quote, of being pleased to give the kingdom the treasures of the sea which nature had so liberally preferred it for without keeping the sea one cannot profit by the sea nor maintain war end quote. Harbors repaired and fortified, arsenals established at various points on the coast, organization of marine regiments, foundation of pilot schools, in fact, the creation of a powerful marine, which in 1642 numbered 63 vessels and 22 galleys, that left the roads of Barcelona after the rejoicings for the capture of Perpignan, and arrived the same evening at Toulon. Such were the fruits of Richelieu's administration of naval affairs. Quote, Instead, said the bailiff of Forbin, of having a handful of rebels forcing us as of late to compose our naval forces of foreigners and implore succor from spain england malta and holland we are at present in a condition to do as much for them if they continue in alliance with us or to beat them when they fall off from us so much progress on every point so many efforts in all directions eighty-five vessels afloat a hundred regiments of infantry and three hundred troops of cavalry almost constantly on a war footing naturally entailed enormous expenses and terrible burdens on the people it was richelieu's great fault to be more concerned about his object than scrupulous as to the means he employed for arriving at it his principles were as harsh as his conduct Quote, reason does not admit of exempting the people from all burdens said he because in such cases on losing the mark of their subjection they would also lose remembrance of their condition and if they were free from tribute would think that they were from obedience also cruel words those and singularly destitute of regard for christian charity and human dignity beside which however must be placed these quote, if the subsidies imposed on the people were not to be kept within moderate bounds even when they were needed for the service of the country they would not cease to be unjust the strong common sense of this great mind did not allow him to depart for long from a certain hard equity posterity has preserved the memory of his equity less than of his hardness men want sympathy more than justice End of chapter thirty nine and of section twenty five Section twenty six of a popular history of France, volume five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume five, by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter forty. Louis the thirteenth, Cardinal Richelieu, the Catholics and the Protestants, part one. Cardinal Richelieu has often been accused of indifference towards the Catholic Church. The Ultramontanes called him the Huguenot's cardinal in so speaking there was either a mistake or a desire to mislead richelieu was all his life profoundly and sincerely catholic not only did no doubt as to the fundamental doctrines of his church trouble his mind but he also gave his mind to her security and her aggrandizement he was a believer on conviction without religious emotions and without the mystic's zeal he laboured for Catholicism whilst securing for himself Protestant alliances, and if the independence of his mind caused him to feel the necessity for a reformation, it was still in the Church and by the Church that he would have had it accomplished. Spirits more fervent and minds more pious than Richelieu's felt the same need. On emerging from the violent struggles of the religious wars, the Catholic Church had not lost her faith, but she had neglected sweetness and light. King Henry the Fourth's conversion had secured to her the victory in France, but she was threatened with letting it escape from her hands by her own fault. God raised up for her some great servants who preserved her from this danger. The oratorical and political brilliancy of the Catholic Church in the reign of Louis Fourteenth has caused men to forget the great religious movement in the reign of Louis Thirteenth. Learned and mystic in the hands of Cardinal Berulle, humane and charitable with Saint Vincent de Paul, bold and saintly with Monsieur de saint Cyran the church underwent from all quarters quickening influences which roused her from her dangerous lethargy the effort was attempted at all points at once the priests had sunk into an ignorance as perilous as their lukewarmness mid all the diplomatic negotiations which he undertook in richelieu's name and the intrigues he with the queen-mother often hatched against him cardinal berulle founded the congregation of the oratory designed to train up well-informed and pious young priests with a capacity for devoting themselves to the education of children as well as the edification of the people Quote, it is a body said bassizet in which everybody obeys and nobody commands End quote. no vow fettered the members of this celebrated congregation which gave to the world malbranche and massillon 
it was again under the inspiration of cardinal berulle renowned for the pious direction of souls that the order of carmelites hitherto confined to spain was founded in france the convent in rue st jacques soon numbered amongst its penitents women of the highest rank the labours of monseigneur de berulle tended especially to the salvation of individual souls those of saint vincent de paul embraced a vaster field and one offering more scope to christian humanity some time before in sixteen ten saint francis de sales had founded under the direction of madame de chantal the order of visitation whose duty was the care of the sick and poor he had left the direction of his new institution to m vincent as was at that time the appellation of the poor priest without birth and without fortune who was one day to be celebrated throughout the world under the name of saint vincent de paul this direction was not enough to satisfy his zeal for charity children and sick the ignorant and the convict all those who suffered in body or spirit seemed to summon m vincent to their aid he founded in sixteen seventeen in a small parish of bresse the charitable society of servants of the poor which became in sixteen thirty three at paris under the direction of madame le gras niece of the keeper of the seals mariac the sisterhood of servants of the sick poor and the cradle of the sisters of charity Quote, they shall not have as a regular rule said saint vincent any monastery but the houses of the sick any chapel but their parish church any cloister but the streets of the town and the rooms of the hospitals any enclosure but obedience any grating but the fear of god or any veil but the holiest and most perfect modesty eighteen thousand daughters of saint vincent de paul of whom fourteen thousand are french still testify at this day to the far-sighted wisdom of their founder his regulations have endured like his work and the necessities of the poor it was to the daughters of charity that m vincent confided the work in connection with foundlings when his charitable impulses led him in sixteen thirty eight to take up the cause of the poor little abandoned things who were perishing by heaps at that time in paris appealing for help on their account to the women of the world one evening when he was in want of money he exclaimed at the house of the duchess of aiguillon cardinal richelieu's niece quote, come now ladies compassion and charity have made you adopt these little creatures as your own children you have been their mothers according to grace since their mothers according to nature have abandoned them consider then whether you too will abandon them their life and their death are in your hands it is time to pronounce their sentence and know whether you will any longer have pity upon them they will live if you continue to take a charitable care of them they will die and perish infallibly if you abandon them saint vincent de paul had confidence in human nature and everywhere on his path sprang up good works in response to his appeals the foundation of mission priests or lazarists designed originally to spread about in the rural districts the knowledge of god still testifies in the east whither they carry at one and the same time the gospel in the name of france to that great awakening of christian charity which signalized the reign of louis the thirteenth the same inspiration created the seminary of saint sulpice by means of m ollier's solicitude the brethren of christian doctrine and the ursulines devoted to the education of childhood and so many other charitable or pious establishments noble fruits of devoutness and christian sacrifice nowhere was this fructuating idea of the sacrifice the immolation of man for god and of the present in prospect of eternity more rigorously understood and practised than amongst the disciples of john du verrier de Oran, abbot of saint cyran more bold in his conceptions than cardinal berulle and saint vincent de paul of a nature more austere and at the same time more ardent he had early devoted himself to the study of theology connected in his youth with a fleming jansen known under the name of jansenius and afterwards created bishop of ypres he adopted with fervour the doctrines as to the grace of god which his friend had imbibed in the school of st augustin and employing in the direction of souls that zealous ardour which makes conquerors he set himself to work to regenerate the church by penance sanctity and sacrifice god supreme reigning over hearts subdued that was his ultimate object and he marched towards it without troubling himself about revolts and sufferings certain that he would be triumphant with god and for him victories gained over souls are from their very nature of a silent sort but m de saint cyran was not content with them he wrote also and his book petrus aurelius published under the veil of the anonymous excited a great stir by its defence of the rights of the bishops against the monks and even against the pope the gallican bishops welcomed at that time with lively satisfaction its eloquent pleadings in favour of their cause but at a later period the french clergy discovered in saint cyran's book 
free thinking concealed under dogmatic forms Quote, in case of heresy any christian may become judge said petrus aurelius who then should be commissioned to define heresy so m de saint cyran was condemned he had been already by an enemy more formidable than the assemblies of the clergy of france cardinal richelieu naturally attracted towards greatness as he was at a later period towards the infant prodigy of the pascals had been desirous of attaching saint cyran to himself Quote, gentlemen said he one day as he led back the simple priest into the midst of a throng of his courtiers here you see the most learned man in europe End quote. but the abbot of saint cyran would accept no yoke but god's he remained independent and perhaps hostile pursuing without troubling himself about the cardinal the great task he had undertaken having had for two years past the spiritual direction of the convent of port royal he had found in mother angelica arnaud the superior and reformer of the monastery in her sister mother agnes and in the nuns of their order souls worthy of him and capable of tolerating his austere instructions before long he had seen forming beside port royal and in the solitude of the fields a nucleus of penitents emulous of the hermits of the desert m le maitre mother angelica's nephew a celebrated advocate in the parliament of paris had quitted all quote, to have no speech but with god end quote. a howling or rugissant penitent he had drawn after him his brothers messieurs de sacy and de sericourt and ere long young lancelot the learned author of greek roots all steeped in the rigours of penitential life, all blindly submissive to M. de saint cyran and his saintly requirements. The director's power over so many eminent minds became too great. Richelieu had comprehended better than the bishops the tendency of M. de saint cyrans ideas and writings. Quote, he continued to publish many opinions, new and leading to dangerous conclusions, says Father Joseph in his memoir, in such sort that the king, being advertised, commanded him to be kept a prisoner in the Bois de Vincennes. End quote. Quote, that man is worse than six armies said cardinal richelieu if luther and calvin had been shut up when they began to dogmatize states would have been spared a great deal of trouble End quote. the consciences of men and the ardor of their souls are not so easily stifled by prison or exile the abbot of saint cyran in spite of the entreaties of his powerful friends remained at vincennes up to the death of cardinal richelieu the seclusionists of port royal were driven from their retreat and obliged to disperse but neither the severities of richelieu nor at a later period those of louis the fourteenth were the true cause of the ultimate powerlessness of jansenism to bring about that profound reformation of the church which had been the dream of the abbot of saint cyran he had wished to immolate sinful man to god and he regarded sanctity as the complete sacrifice of human nature corrupt to its innermost core human conscience could not accept this cruel yoke its liberty revolted against so narrow a prison and the protestant reformation with a doctrine as austere as that of m de saint cyran but more true and more simple in its practical application offered strong minds the satisfaction of direct and personal relations between god and man it saw the way to satisfy them without crushing them and that is why the kingly power in france succeeded in stifling jansenism without having ever been able to destroy the protestant faith Cardinal Richelieu dreaded the doctrines of M. de saint cyran and still more those of the Reformation, which went directly to the emancipation of souls. But he had the wit to resist ecclesiastical encroachments, and for all his being a cardinal, never did minister maintain more openly the independence of the civil power. Quote, the king, in things temporal, recognizes no sovereign save God. End quote. That had always been the theory of the Gallican Church. Quote, the Church of France is in the kingdom, and not the kingdom in the Church said the jurisconsult Loiseau, thus subjecting ecclesiastics to the common law of all citizens. The French clergy did not understand it so. They had recourse to the liberties of the Gallican Church in order to keep up a certain measure of independence as regarded Rome, but they would not give up their ancient privileges, and especially the right of taking an independent share in the public necessities without being taxed as a matter of law and obligation. Here it was that Cardinal Richelieu withstood them, he maintained that the ecclesiastics and the brotherhoods, not having the right to hold property in France by Mormain, the king tolerated their possession of his grace, but he exacted the payment of seigneurial dues. The clergy at that time possessed more than a quarter of the property in France. The tax to be paid amounted, it is said, to eighty millions. The subsidies further demanded reached a total of eight millions six hundred livres. The clergy, in dismay, wished to convoke an assembly to determine their conduct, and after a great deal of difficulty it was authorized by the cardinal. 
Before long he intimated to the five prelates who were most hostile to him that they must quit the assembly and retire to their diocese. Quote, there are, said the Bishop of Autun, who was entirely devoted to Richelieu, some who show great delicacy about agreeing to all that the king demands, as if they had a doubt whether all the property of the church belonged to him or not, and whether his majesty, leaving the ecclesiastics wherewithal to provide for their subsistence and a moderate establishment, could not take all the surplus. End quote. That sort of doctrine would never do for the clergy. Still, they consented to pay five millions and a half, the sum to which the minister lowered his pretensions. Quote, the wants of the state, said Richelieu, are real, those of the church are fanciful and arbitrary. If the king's armies had not repulsed the enemy, the clergy would have suffered far more. End quote. Whilst the cardinal imposed upon the French clergy the obligations common to all subjects, he defended the kingly power and majesty against the ultramontaines, and especially against the Jesuits. Several of their pamphlets had already been censured by his order when Father Sancturel published a treatise on heresy and schism, clothed with the Pope's approbation, and containing, amongst other dangerous propositions, the following, quote, The Pope can depose emperor and kings for their iniquities, or for personal incompetence seeing that he has a sovereign, supreme, and absolute power. The work was referred to the Parliament, who ordered it to be burned in Place de Grève. There was talk of nothing less than the banishment of the entire order. Father Coton, superior of the French Jesuits, was summoned to appear before the council. He gave up Father Sancterelle unreservedly, making what excuse he best could for the approbation of the Pope and of the general of the Jesuits. The condemnation of the work was demanded, and it was signed by sixteen French fathers. The Parliament was disposed to push the matter farther, when Richelieu, always as prudent as he was firm in his relations with this celebrated order, represented to the King that there are, quote, certain abuses which are more easily put down by passing them over than by resolving to destroy them openly, and that it was time to take care lest proceedings should be carried to a point which might be as prejudicial to his service as past action had been serviceable to it, end quote the jesuits remained in france and their college at clermont was not closed but they published no more pamphlets against the cardinal they even defended him at need richelieu's grand quarrel with the clergy was nearing its end when the climax was reached of a disagreement with the court of rome dating from some time back the pope had never forgiven the cardinal for not having accepted his mediation in the affair with spain on the subject of the valtalin he would not accede to the desire which Richelieu manifested to become legate of the Holy See in France, as Cardinal d'Amboise had been, and when Marshal d'Estrées arrived as ambassador at Rome, his resolute behaviour brought the misunderstanding to a head. The Pope refused the customary funeral honours to Cardinal La Valette, who had died in battle, without dispensation, at the head of the King's army in Piedmont. Richelieu preserved appearances no longer. The King refused to receive the Pope's nuncio, and prohibited the bishops from any communication with him. The quarrel was envenomed by a pamphlet called Optatus Gallus. The cardinal's enemies represented him as a new Luther, ready to excite a schism and found a patriarchate in France. Father Rabardeau of the Jesuits' order maintained in reply that the act would not be schismatical, and that the consent of Rome would be no more necessary to create a patriarchate in France than it had been to establish those of Constantinople and Jerusalem. Urban the Eighth took fright. He sent to France Julius Mazarin, at that time vice-legate, and already frequently employed in the negotiations between the court of Rome and Cardinal Richelieu, who had taken a great fancy to him. The French clergy had just obtained authority to vote the subsidy in an assembly, and the Pope contented himself with this feeble concession. Mazarin put the finishing touch to the reconciliation, and received as recompense the Cardinal's hat. In fact, the victory of the civil power was complete, and the independence of the crown clearly established. Quote, his holiness, said the cardinal, ought to commend the zeal shown by his majesty for the welfare of the church, and to remain satisfied with the respect shown him by an appeal to his authority, which his majesty might have dispensed with in this matter, having his parliaments to fall back upon for the chastisement of those who lived evilly in his kingdom. End quote. In principle, the supreme question between the court of Rome and the kingly power remained undecided and it showed wisdom on the part of Urban the Eighth, as well as of Cardinal Richelieu, never to fix fundamentally and within their exact limits the rights and pretensions of the Church or the Crown. Cardinal Richelieu had another battle to deliver, and another victory, which was to be more decisive, to gain. During his exile at Avignon he had written against the Reformers, violently attacking their doctrines and their precepts. He was therefore personally engaged in the theological strife, and more hotly than has been made out. 
but he was above everything a great politician and the rebellion of the reformers their irregular political assemblies their alliances with the foreigner occupied him far more than their ministers preaching it was state within state that the reformers were seeking to found and that the cardinal wished to upset seconded by the prince of cond the king had put an end to the war which cost the life of the constable de luynes but the peace concluded at montpellier on the nineteenth of november sixteen twenty two had already received many a blow pacific councils amongst the reformers were little by little dying out together with the old servants of henry the fourth duplessis mornay had lately died on november eleventh sixteen twenty three at his castle of forest sur sevre and the direction of the party fell entirely into the hands of the duke of rohan a fiery temper and soured by misfortunes as well as by continual efforts made on the part of his brother the duke of soubise more restless and less earnest than he hostilities broke out afresh at the beginning of the year sixteen twenty five the reformers complained that instead of demolishing fort louis which commanded la rochelle all haste was being made to complete the ramparts they had hoped to see raised to the ground a small royal fleet mustered quietly at le blavet and threatened to close the sea against the rochelais the peace of montpellier had left the protestants only two surety places montauban and la rochelle and they clung to them with desperation on the sixth of january sixteen twenty five soubise suddenly entered the harbour of le blavet with twelve vessels and seizing without a blow the royal ships towed them off in triumph to la rochelle a fatal success which was to cost that town dear End of section twenty six